and it is a bright sunshiny beautiful day here no clouds anywhere overhead and uh, the game time temperature is somewhere in the the 70s probably the mid 70s and uh, we're just about ready to play ball here John Miller Dave Campbell and Kirby Puckett and Kirby welcome to the telecast uh, postseason play a little bit in a different mode for you though well no doubt about it I mean uh, it's nothing like the playoffs I mean a lot of guys play their whole careers and don't get a chance to experience this John so in order for you to just be one of the guys who just get here and knowing that uh, in the five game series anything can happen and any team can win you could probably be going on to the next step and ultimately the World Series and the Orioles take the field now David Wells in charge with the responsibility of trying to shut down this high power Cleveland offense today. But Wells, look at those numbers, not very good. 11 wins, 14 losses, over five in ERA, and gave up a lot of home runs, too. Well, no doubt about it. But anytime you get the ball up, and especially in this ballpark, the ball carry carries everywhere. And, uh, you know, he's out there trying to do the best he can. He's got a tough job today. If it's offense you're looking for, you're at the right game. One of the keys defensively for David Wells and the Baltimore Orioles is going to be their ability to keep Kenny Lofton and Omar Vizquel off base. You see Suroff Anderson and Benny in the outfield, but Chris Hoyles has only thrown out 18% of the runners, and with David Wells on the mound, the opponents have scored, uh, stolen 26 out of 30. So if Lofton, who has 75, and Vizquel with 35, 110 stolen bases between them, if they could get aboard, it could be a long afternoon for Hoyles, who has an arthritic shoulder. So there's Lofton ready to lead it off. He led the league with 75 steals. He's hitting 317 for the year. 14 homers, 67 battered in. He's, he's not just a guy who gets on base. I mean, he's got a little pop, Kirby. 14 home runs. You can't take it for granted. You can't just uh, lay it in there and think he's going to hit a base hit. He can hurt you. Mike Hargrove. I remember sometime last year we ran into Jim Leland. Doing a National League game on Sunday night baseball, and he started commenting about Mike Hargrove, and he says maybe it's time that Hargrove starts getting recognition as being one of the top managers around. And I mean, certainly the bottom line is there: 100 wins last year to the World Series, and uh, here they are again, the, the best record in the American League, Dave. Kind of one of those understated guys, an organizational type guy, and they build from within with John Hart and Mike Hargrove. They're not the type of managers that call a lot of attention to themselves, and that seems to be more and more in the vogue in this day and age in baseball. Davey Johnson the Orioles manager first year manager and of course a great track record of success wherever he has managed in uh, first New York and uh, then Cincinnati he came here and uh, the Orioles underachieved for the first two thirds of the year had a great stretch run to make the postseason but he said after it was all said and done he said you know I wanted this one more than I ever wanted any championship with any team and he says when you want something that bad it, it takes a toll on you. So here we go. Kenny Lofton ready to stand in. The 1996 Major League Baseball Divisional Series ready to commence with it. The bunt, and it's popped up foul right back toward Kirby Puckett. And out of play for strike one. That's not much of a surprise to you, is it, Kirby? This guy's a pretty good bunt. This guy can, uh, he can bunt with the best of them. As you can see, Zeal's way in at third base. He still feels that if he gets the ball down, he can beat it out. Kind of like Rod Carew, no matter how close they came in, he still felt he could beat out a play. That's a good feeling to have. I used to have that feeling a long, long time ago. <laughs> One strike, the count, and the curveball is foul off the left field line and back into the crowd. So quickly, David Wells is ahead of Kenny Lofton, 0 and 2. Talked to Kenny before the game today, and he said in the last two weeks he's hit four balls down off his uh, front leg and back leg, and he said he's a little tender, but he said it's not going to slow him down. Zeal is backed up at third base now. A high fastball taken for a ball. One ball and two strikes. You see the jugs got raining. And uh, Kirby Wells has got a little pat. I mean, he throws, he throws hard. He's kind of sneaky. He sneak up on you a little bit. Kind of low you to sleep with that curveball. And he has a great change up, too, that you won't see against a left-handed hitter, but you'll see it against the right hand. One ball and two strikes. Two balls, two strikes. 
key for David Wells and Kirby talked about it earlier is staying ahead in the count. He can use all his pitches in and the hitters won't be as, an aggr as aggressive. He got 0-2 on Loft and he wants to make something happen here. And he swung at it. Strike three. He went back with a high hard one. Lofton tried to hold up. Could not do so. There is one away. Well, as you know, the high fastball is the hardest pitch in the world to lay off of. I can, I can kind of attest to it. And once you start to swing, it's kind of hard to stop as you saw Kenny. Too late. So he is gone. And here is Kevin Seitzer. Lofton uh, down on strikes. And now Seitzer. Now this lineup took on a, a much different look to it with the arrival of Kevin Seitzer for the Milwaukee Brewers. And of course, Cleveland had been very poor against left handed pitching not just this year last year as well and that's a strike on the outside six consecutive fastballs by David Wells didn't know if he was going to try to establish the breaking ball early and then go fastball just the opposite in the early going uh, Jugs going to get that one at 93 miles an hour Jim Chomey is on deck and is fouled on the right field line and quickly Again, Wells ahead, 0 and 2, just as he was with Kenny Lofton. Very important for David. The, 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 the far ahead he gets, he didn't have to worry about uh, kind of guys sitting on his fastball. Now you got a chance to use all his pitches. Hopefully, he won't have to use too many to get sights out. There's the curveball, and it's a base hit. Zeal made a dive for it, couldn't get to it. Kevin Sanchez all but hit that one off the ground. He's a good hitter, man. It's kind of hard to get good hitters out, and uh, I think he wants. I think he wanted to waste a pitch, but uh, I think that was too too good of a pitch. Really waste. You see, Kevin Sykes reached out, Zeal playing on the line a little bit. Good try by Zeal, but Kevin Sykes can hit. That's called a false hit, also. Cal Ripken lets the third baseman know what pitch is coming. It was a curveball, so Zeal was expecting to pull it. You saw him take one step towards the line, and he hit it to the left. Now Jim Tomey. Powerful left handed swinger 311 38 home runs and 116 runs battered in he just seems to get better and better I mean you look at him big strong guy with a big swing he looks like the, the prototypical power hitter but he's he's hit 300 now two years in a row crowding the plate and it's a called strike stands right on top of the plate man he stands really close to the plate and uh, wants that either he wants the ball inside he wants it out over the plate I don't know how you're going to do it but this guy seems to get the job done every time and he's big and strong. Well when you get into the Cleveland power you stay in it for a while there's Tommy 38 homers then Bell behind him with 48 homers then Franco a great hitter and Ramirez another 30 plus home run man. And it's 0 and 2. Got the good fastball past him. I think everybody who follows baseball and looks at statistics once in a while know that when major league hitters have two strikes on them, doesn't matter if it's 0-2, 1-2, or a full count, they hit less than three or less than 200. And Wells has been 0-2 on every one of the three Indian hitters. So on 0-2 to Seitzer, he threw him a curveball, and Seitzer bounced it into left field. 0-2 to Tony. Seitzer at first, one out. High fastball misses. One ball and two strikes. I don't know who said David Wells can't throw hard. He's throwing about 93 miles an hour. I don't know who said that's not hard. Ed Dobson said he didn't know which one was going to show up today, <laughs> and it looks like the hard throwing David Wells in the early going. I tell you, 93 miles an hour is pretty hard. The Wells got a little extra rest. Did not have to make the start Sunday in Toronto, so he's working today with six days of rest. One ball, two strikes. Sights are back to the bag at first. And again, that was a, an area, as uh, Dave Campbell pointed out, in which Wells was really remiss this year. I mean, even though he's a left hander, very poor at holding on would be base dealers. And Chris Hoyles, with the arthritic shoulder, just is unable to throw the ball very well. And it's not been a very good combination. A lot of guys, other than big base dealers, have been running against this combination Wells and Hoyles. One out, one ball, two strikes to count. Two and two. A lot of times managers control the running game by a set of signs, and occasionally pitching coaches call pitches. 
And you see Chris Hoyles looking in, and I think Pat Dobson is calling a lot of pitches early for Wells. If he gets into a good pattern, maybe they'll turn it over to Hoyles at that point. Two balls, two strikes, one out. And again, fouled this one back out of play. Pat Dobson, longtime Major League pitcher, now the Orioles' uh, first year pitching coach. Took a little heat earlier this year when the Orioles pitching was so bad. But of course the Orioles made their stretch run. The pitching was vastly improved. Yeah, one, one sunflower seeds a fastball, two's a curve. Now Pat's going through some signs now. The sunflower system. Twenty two the count to Tom. Fastball again. Popped up foul. So Tommy hanging in there. Ball back out of play on the third base side. Two and two the count. Kirby is a hitter. Did you feel the more balls you could foul off and an at bat the advantage was more yours? Well, no, not really. I usually try to put that first one in play, Dave, when I played. Uh, uh, I went back to the old school theory. You know, that usually the pitcher was trying to get ahead of you back in the old days. And, you, and my theory was I'm going to try to get ahead of him, too. So we'd all meet in the middle, hopefully. But uh, usually I was, uh, I was looking for that first fastball I could see and hopefully put it in play and hopefully not hit at anybody. Tommy, on the other hand, is a guy who always goes about as deep in the count as any hitter in the American League. Did he swing? He, well, it ticked off the bat. A foul tip held by Hoyle, strike three. Tommy, who had walked 123 times this year, and he also struck out a lot too. So two strikeouts. For David Wells. That time the umpire did not have to make a ruling on the check swing. The ball glanced off the bat. So here is Albert Bell. 311 average, 48 homers, 38 doubles, and 148 runs batted in to lead the American League. Last year, 50 home runs, and he backed that up with 48 this year. Two men down, runner at first. Right to Zeal. No play. Sights are safely in the second. Albert Bell safe at first. An error to Todd Zeal. Not a good beginning for Todd. He already got nailed on a false step on the curveball that Sights are hit. Then he gets in between hop here. He blocked it with his body, but he couldn't spot the ball. You could tell after it hit his body, he couldn't find it. He gets his body in front of it, knocks it down, but you see him going to the left and the ball's back to the right. And no chance to get Albert Bell at that point. I think he made the right decision by not throwing the ball. He thought that if he threw it, then he would uh, make the situation worse than it is. So he decided to just hold on to it. Hopefully, uh, hoping that it won't hurt him. David can get him out of the inning right here. Well, the Cleveland Indians, uh, one of their weaknesses is uh, supposedly their defense. And the last couple of years, they made a lot of, er uh, of errors, and they tried to correct some of those problems this year with the trades they made. Baltimore, on the other hand, figured to have a very strong defense. But it's the Orioles who make the first defensive miscue and now Cleveland with a chance to take advantage of it and here's a guy who's just been an outstanding hitter for a long time Julio Franco one time batting champion hitting 322 right field and it looks like an easy play for Bonilla and that's the inning two men left for Cleveland the 50 home run man Brady Anderson will be leading it off for Baltimore when we get back well, we've seen David Wells take on the Cleveland Indians in the first inning. Now, Charles Nagy will take the mound for Cleveland against Baltimore. Davey Johnson's ball club, the Orioles, the sluggingest team in the history of Major League Baseball. They hit 257 home runs this year, obliterating the existing record set by the Yankees in 61. And here is the lineup, and you'll notice a lot of guys with a lot of power. The FedEx Orioles lineup, Brady Anderson, 50 home runs center field. Todd Zeal at third base. Roberto Alomar, his biggest home run year, second base. Palmero, first base, fourth in the league in RBIs as well. Bobby Bonilla, 116 RBIs in right. Cal Ripken, 102 RBIs. Eddie Murray, the DH, 501 career homers now. BJ Surhoff, his best home run year. And the catcher, Chris Hoyles, with 25 homers, he hits ninth. And on the mound, 17 game winner, Charles Nagy, well capable of. Shutting down those big Oriole bats, Kirby. No doubt about it. Nagy's going to keep that ball down. He gets a lot of ground ball outs. Got a good split finger fastball. 
a good slider and got a big slow curveball too. So he's going to do his best to keep the ball down and hopefully keep it in the ballpark. Tough to do against this guy, Brady Anderson. And you see that sinker right away. Brady 50 homers, 110 runs battered in, a 297 average. And it's interesting, he only hit 19 of those 50 home runs in this ballpark, which is a, a great home run park. No doubt about it. I'll tell you what, not a bad team. You got a leadoff guy hitting 50 home runs. That's incredible. So keeping the ball in the ballpark against Baltimore, that's what it's all about. And that's what Nagy's got to do today. The Orioles have many times this year had a hard time scoring runs if they did not hit the long ball. Well, that's how they win ball game. They're going to try to do it today, I'm sure. That is a foul on the first base side. John Stearns, the Orioles' first base coach, picks it up. Utah Street, the corridor out there, a promenade inside the, the ballpark uh, proper itself between the big warehouse, the 19th century warehouse, the old B&O warehouse, and uh, the right field area lined with shops and uh, Boog's Barbecue. And, of course, some bleachers have been added just above the big wall in right field. Headed for Boog's Barbecue. One nothing Baltimore. Under Utah Street. Well, Brady Anderson did that more often than any player in Major League history this year. He broke Bobby Bonds' major league record by 12 times leading off a game with a home run, and now he has done it in his very first postseason at bat. Charles Nagy had only given up one home run to the Orioles this year, and that had been Brady Anderson. He's just hit his second. Now Todd Zeal. The fans are on their feet. They haven't finished cheering yet. A strike to Zeal, the former National Leaguer acquired from the Philadelphia Phillies. And a trade just before the deadline to lock in the rosters for the postseason. Zeal had 20 homers and 80 RBIs with the Phillies. He was their cleanup hitter. And the count is 0 and 2. And he came here to Baltimore and had a big impact immediately. He finished in a big slump, going one for his last 38 to end the regular year and only 237 average split as an Oreo. Deep left field with Bell. Reaches up looking to that bright sunshine to make the catch. What about that? Uh, what about that outfield, Kirby? And the tough day in the sunshine. Well, it's a tough day any day. The sun is shining for an outfielder. It's the toughest play in the world to make. And the reception for Roberto Alomar. A lot of cheers. Some scattered boos, and many even rose. The standing ovation for Alomar, and he takes ball one. I suppose this time of year, if he's your player, Dave, the, the fans have one interest that he's in there and he has a great series. Oh, absolutely. Nagy's got to get his breaking ball down. He's hung two and he's gotten crushed. That's a better one there. One ball, one strike to Roberto Alomar. Had a big year for the Orioles. 328 average, 22 homers, 94 RBIs. And as usual, played a great second base. Over the middle. Deflected by Vizcal away from Kent. Although I think he would have beaten it out anyway. A base hit for Alomar. And Brady got a high curveball there from Nagy and uh, hit it out of the ballpark. I tell you what, he hasn't been missing much. You get the ball up to him, put it in the zone. He's been doing one thing with it this year, and that's hitting it out of the ballpark. He's had a great year. Also, you have to remember the good thing about the starting the playoffs today is that everybody's hitting the same thing today. Everybody starts off at zero. Even the pitcher's ERA at zero. Now here is Rafael Palmero. Trying to bring up his average against Kirby. Hitting zero. What's the matter with him? Palmero had did a little better than that in the regular season. Though. 39 homers, 142 RBIs, fourth in the league in that category. 289 average. He's a guy that kind of makes it look so easy up there, doesn't he? Three word explanation. He can hit. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can say about Ralph. He can hit. Roberto Alomar at first. Franco on the back with him. His brother, Sandy Alomar, the catcher, charged with the responsibility of maybe having to try and throw Roberto out. 
I guess this is a dream come true for brothers to play against each other. I can't uh, think of anything else. I know that uh, he's got a tough job trying to hold his brother down over there, but his brother can throw too, so we'll see what happens. And it's 2-0 out of Palmero. John, you were we were talking last night, and uh, the Orioles early on under David Johnson, he tried to make them a running team, a lot of hit and run, but the last half of the season, they didn't run hardly at all. Even Robbie Alomar, only 17 steals. There was so many runs scored in Orioles games. So many that they scored, so many that they gave up. You just thought, hey, it's diminishing returns when you risk giving up an out. And it's 3 0 to Palmero. Bobby Bonilla is on deck. There was a time in his career when Robbie Alomar thought the best pitch to steal on was 3 0. We'll see if he's in that mode today. He figures the pitcher doesn't pay any attention on that count. Again, he's only stolen 17 times this year, so he's not in that 40 50 plateau he's been in in the past. Well, that's because he's been jo they've been jogging around the bases a lot around here this year, so. There he goes. He'll make it to second. Jeff Kent throws out Palmero, who swung away on 3 0. Stayed out of the double play, at least, by running. So Robbie Alomar, figuring pitchers just don't pay attention to him, was running on the play. Alomar gets a good jump. Maggie gives him kind of a cursory look. Kent stays down, sees he doesn't really have a play at second, and he takes the play at first base to retire Palmero. Also, a good thing that Roberto Alomar deal with that was look back to see where the ball was. If he wasn't looking, might have hit him. He had to jump over the top of it. Here's Bobby Bonilla. And he chases that uh, pitch and uh, it's on one. It's a tough pitch. I think there was a fork ball right there. Did you see Nagy's and try to keep the ball down and away from lefties, I think, and uh, kind of running in on righties and they go away with a slider. So we'll see what happens. Well, they ended up having a fine year with the Orioles. 28 homers, 116 battered in. One of four Orioles. Over 100 RBIs this year. And of course, then Zeal had 99. Most of them were the Phillies. Alomar had 94. I mean, this, this club just had so much offense and it defies, defies rational discussion. <laughs> Cal Ripken is on deck. One to nothing, Baltimore ahead. Alomar at second, two down. And the count goes to two and one. He went to the fastball there. One time you could get Bobby Bonilla all day long if you could make good pitches with your changeups. This year against Charles Nagy, he is five for eight. So he's done pretty well over the last year and a half career wise against Nagy. That is foul. He drilled it, but foul. Again, an off speed pitch way out in front of it. Two balls, two strikes. You see some uh, scattered clouds off in the distance as we look in to the Camden Yards ballpark from down the right field line. The red, white, and blue bunting is out, a baseball tradition for the postseason. One nothing Orioles. Alomar in second, ready to go in anything. Two and two to Bonilla. And it's full now. Three and two. Now first base is open. You got a right-handed hitter coming up next. Well, he got 20-some home runs too, so you can't hide from these guys. Wherever you go, there's home runs and RBIs everywhere, so you're gonna have to face somebody. the fork ball and he took it ball four and now he'll have to face Ripken and Ripken actually had a long slump there August and September but finished up swinging a pretty hot bat I think that's just a matter of Nagy knowing that Benia has owned him he was going to throw him the perfect pitch either make him chase out of the strike zone or go after Ripken Cal's hitting 278 lifetime against Nagy so he's right at his seasonal average against Charles but the way Bonilla is on Maggie, I think Charles remembered that and just said, hey, hit this splitter if you want to try to get a base hit. So this is the part of the Orioles lineup that harkens back to their world championship team of 83. Ripken at the plate, Murray on deck. And a good fastball, knee high, right on the outside. It's 0-1. There's Roberto Alomar, got an infield single. He's at second base. And Bobby Bonilla, who walked, is at first base. And they'll both be off and running at the crack of the bat with two down. Going on to Cal Ripken. Different looking stance for Cal. <laughs> Broken back. This Cal throws him out at first base. And that ends the inning. Baltimore has gone ahead with a run of the first inning of the Brady Addison home run. Manny Ramirez coming up for Cleveland. 
Major League Baseball Divisional Series Game One between the Cleveland and uh, Baltimore here at Camden Yards. I'm John Miller with Dave Campbell and Kirby Puckett. Omar Vizquel has had a frayed labor all year. Ripken hits this ball. Tommy screens off Vizquel. Omar looks to second, goes to first. It's a good thing it was Cal because you can see that throw die. He's not very strong armed right now with that labor. Be having some surgery apparently when it's all over with and get it uh, cleaned out. And for now, playing hurt here is Manny Ramirez. Powerful right handed hitter, and he loops one foul off to the right side. Ramirez came back this year with 33 homers and 112 batted in. Young guy from, uh, grew up in the New York City area, and big year last year, another big year this year. Kind of an Albert Bell look at the plate. Crouch near the plate. And he takes outside. One ball, one strike, one nothing. The Orioles ahead of Cleveland here in the second inning. Jeff Kent and then Sandy Alomar will follow against David Wells. Wells uh, threw mostly fastballs in that first inning. Gave up one hit. That one is gone if it's fair. It's tied up. Manny Ramirez. And he crushed that one a shot down the left field line. And it is one to one. Both pitchers have been hurt with their curveball in the early going. Nagy gave one up to Brady Anderson, and Wells got that one up to Manny Ramirez. The pitch looked like a fastball right down the middle. Manny can uh, get hit fastballs with the best of them. Line drive, right? One on, one handed too. You see the ball, he hit the ball a long way. It's out in front and everything, and still hit it out. Pitchers have a tough job today to keep these guys uh, keep both offenses at bay, and it's a tough job to do. But uh, I think they can handle it. We'll see what happens. Now Jeff Kent, former New York Met, and the curveball is low. One ball and no strikes. So Brady Anderson's home run, leading off the first inning for Baltimore, has been answered by. Manny Ramirez leading off the second inning with a home run. Jeff Kent with power. But uh, he didn't do a whole lot of hitting once uh, he came to Cleveland. Kent with the Indians in 102 at bats, only three home runs, although he got his average up to 265 with Cleveland. But with the Mets, uh, usually up around the 20 home run level. Jeff Kent can hit a little bit. I think uh, everybody is kind of down on his defense a little bit, but. Uh, he could definitely play the game, or else he wouldn't be here, that's for sure. Playing second base today for Cleveland. Just inside with a fastball from Wells. Two and one to Kent. You see with the Mets, he was hitting 290. But again, it was a disappointment for the Mets this year with the home runs and RBIs. 12 runs, or 12 home runs total for Kent this year. That's a high foul back out of play on the first base side. Two and two the count. Well, Kirby, uh, this is a happy ballpark for you. You came here for the All Star game. Yeah. Was it 93? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I was, I was tired too when I came here. And uh, just goes to show you that on any, any given day, anything can happen. And I uh, stepped up to the plate against Moore Holland, hit a home run, and then hit a double later on, and was MVP of the All Star game. It's something I never expected. Two and two the count. Cleveland second. John, you mentioned the Baltimore defense. I mean, that's just been a tradition here over the last eight years. About 55 fewer errors than any team in the major league. It looks to me like it's a wonderful infield to play on. You watch games here on a regular basis. Well, Rafael Palmero and uh, Cal Ripken both saying an excellent infield. Zeal said it was one of the best infields he played on all year when he came over here from uh, the National League. Here's Sandy Alomar. A lot of Alomars here today. Sandy, the Cleveland catcher, 263 for the year, 11 home runs. He was in a slump for a good part of the season. Both he and Pena, the Indians were not getting much production from their catchers, but Sandy finished up hitting over 300 for the month of September. One ball, no strikes to Cal. One out, nobody on. A 1 1 game. Omar Vizquel is on deck. And that fastball waved at and missed. Strike one. One ball and one strike to Alomar. I thought the pitch was a changeup. Uh, myself, it looked, looked to be fooled a little bit. But as you can see, a tail and fastball away from him. 
One ball, one strike to count. Curveball is hit hard but foul on the third base side. One and two now to Alomar. Alomar, I saw him a couple of weeks ago in Chicago. Cleveland was coming in to try and wrap up the division against the White Sox. He says, well, hopefully we'll take care of them in a couple of weeks and then we'll face Baltimore in the postseason and I will kick Roberto's backside, he said. <laughs> or something to that effect. I'm, I'm not quoting him exactly on that one. Pop up. Zeal. And that is shot number two. This is just the first of a lot of baseball coming up at 4 o'clock. The San Diego Padres, who won the West, taking on the St. Louis Cardinals in St. Louis. That'll be on ESPN. Then the Texas Rangers and the New York Yankees at Yankee Stadium. That'll be on NBC. My colleague Joe Morgan will be there. And uh, that's the rest of the lineup for the playoffs today. The Atlanta Braves and Los Angeles Dodgers will not get started until tomorrow in the National League. There's a fastball a little bit high to Omar Vizquel. Kirby, this guy come become a pretty good hitter. I mean, he you think of him as a glove guy, 297. He hit pretty well last year as well. well no doubt about it. He can definitely, uh, everybody knows about his glove. I think he's gotten a lot better uh, this year as far as taking pitches and getting on base in front of Lofton when he did to get a chance to hit ninth. And uh, he stands right on top of the plate and he makes you work. I mean, if you throw it right there, he can fool you. He can surprise you with a little bit of power too. So. 2 0 to Viscal. Two down, nobody on. And a pop up foul that will come back out of play. Viscal. A little bit uh, less of a hitter as a right hander than as a lefty, at least this year. I think he's a better right hander hitter than a left hander, but I could be wrong. I think he has more power, I think, from the right side. First time Walls got behind anybody, 2 0 through the batting. Right. Uh, he comes back, and it's 2 and 2. 1 to 1 in the top of the second inning. Some guys have cousins when you're hitting. Kirby, I know you had some. Vizquel, not David Wells. One for 23 lifetime against Wells. <laughs> and a pop foul that will go back out of play on the first base side. Lead off man Kenny Lofton is on deck. And he would be next. Like I said, the good thing about today is that everybody started off batting zero today. Mm -hmm. So all averages and everything are good, but uh, you got to start a whole new average in playoffs in the World Series. Curved him but missed with it. Three and two. Oh, well, yes. Some of the numbers. Uh, this guy, uh, his average lower as a right hander, but a little more pop as a right hander. Guess but I was right. Not huh? a whole lot of pop from either side, though, when you come down to it. <laughs> I mean, we're talking in relative terms here. Three and two to Viscal. And he walked him. This guy that David Wells has owned over the years, and he has walked him. Not a, not a good sign, uh, Dave. No, he got behind two and zero, oh and then started uh, came back after him two and one. But you know, John, you were talking and Kirby talking about you know your average starts all over in the postseason. I mean, sometimes you expect big guys like Kirby did in the uh, series against Charlie Lee Brandt to come up big, but sometimes in the postseason it's big surprises. Guys like Brian Doyle and Dusty Rhodes. I mean, Mark Lemke in the '91 World Series. You just never know who the hero might be. Gene Tennis in 1972. Absolutely. Here's Kenny Lofton. Left-handed hitter, and uh, back to the bag is Viscal. And uh, I mean, with the leadoff man up and two down, I mean, he's got to be running now. You send him, Kirby. I think so. You're uh, telling him to go now. I'm telling him to go. 35 steals. Worst case scenario, you got Lofton leading off next inning. That's a pretty good deal. Pretty good option for Mike Hargrove. Low risk. There he goes. And he, he went on a curveball, and he is. At second, he overslid the bag. Ripken kept the glove down, and Vizquel went right past the bag and got tagged out. And on that unlikely play, the inning has ended. One to one as we head to the second. The Orioles have Eddie Murray coming up. And Kirby, an old friend of yours, Eddie Murray coming up right now for Baltimore. Yeah, he's a good friend of mine, and uh, he's done, done a lot of good things, and been a good friend of mine for the whole time I've been in the major league. So, first ball swinging, and Murray, the former Cleveland Indian, hits one down the left field line. That one is falling, and it's a foul ball. Great effort by Vizquel, and uh, Albert Bell really never got into that play, but Vizquel with a, a virtuoso performance. 
was the closest one to it, and the Indians were, were glad that it went foul. Well, we saw Ray Lankford tear his rotator cuff on a play very similar to this. This Kell that time extended his left arm, and you see Jim Tomey couldn't even find the ball. This Kell, though, has the better angle. But Omar, we did see Lankford. He tore his rotator on his throwing arm. Vizquel already has a freight labor on his throwing arm and almost hurt his left arm there. Eddie Murray, he hit the last 10 of those 22 home runs upon coming to Baltimore in late July. The trade was made. Kent Merker went to Cleveland in that deal. Murray back with the Orioles. Nagy throws him out. There's one away. Murray, of course, uh, a key man in that Cleveland ball club that won 100 games last year and had some big hits in the World Series as well. Hit a home run in the series against Tom Glavin. Had a big uh, hit in an extra inning ball game for Cleveland. And Eddie Murray, uh, Kirby, when you talk about in the clutch, I mean, that's Eddie Murray's career. I mean, he's been one of the best around driving in the big runs. No doubt about it. He's been doing it for 20 years now. And uh, I don't think it, everybody just expects nothing else of Eddie but, uh, but the best. And, uh, He's definitely one of the best to ever play the game. Now B.J. Serhoff, former Milwaukee Brewer. Like two of the Brewers' uh, top hitters these last couple of years. In this series now, with there was Seitzer for Cleveland and uh, B.J. Serhoff with the Orioles. Serhoff developed some power here in Baltimore. 21 home runs, most of them in this ballpark. B.J. could hit. He could always hit. It's just uh, he got hurt a lot when he was in Milwaukee. And if you hurt, then uh, that's not much you can do. Playing third base for the Orioles and did a pretty good job there. And when Zeal came over in the trade, they moved him to left field. There's a drive into deep right center field. This one headed for the bleachers. Two to one, Baltimore. Welcome to ESPN's Home Run Derby. Camden Yards today. Three runs, three homers. Well, we can't be too surprised by that based on what these teams did the regular year. Kirby, here's a look at it. Fastball inside, right where BJ wants it, right where any left hander hit, wants it down and in. And put a good swing on it, kept his head down and put a good swing and nothing new out of the ballpark. So here's Chris Hoy, another powerful hitter. 25 home runs for him this year. He's the ninth place hitter. Every man in the Orioles lineup is a home run threat. The, the lowest home run total of any Oriole in the lineup was beat was uh, BJ Serhoff. Hit only 21. Oh, is that all? Oils hits one high in the air. Shallow right. Ramirez in, can't out. And can't takes it just in front of Ramirez. A little confusion there. A lot of confusion. Usually uh it's up to the outfielder to make that call. Man, he's coming in. I think he kind of flinched like the sun was in his eyes. I don't know if he could see it or not, but uh, Lucky Kent went out and made that play, but that was almost a disaster right there. Well, so many times in the history of postseason with that October sky, the sun always being a little bit lower. Outfielders, infielders have a lot of problems. You think back to Willie Davis in 1966, three years in one inning. I mean, that was really a struggle. Or was that 63? 66. No, 66. Yeah. The first uh, time Baltimore was in postseason play. Here's Brady Anderson. He led off the Orioles first with a home run. Brady Anderson, kind of a kind of a student of, of home run lore. He knows all the names of everybody who's ever hit 50 home runs in a season and recite them off to you. Except he won't put his own name in there. Lofton into right center, and that ends the inning. Well, Baltimore's had two at bats and two home runs. B.J. Serhoff going deep here. Lofton, Seitzer, and Tomey coming up. Two to one, Oriole. We're at Camden Yards in Baltimore. Game one of the division series, the Orioles and the Indians. And there's the look from the rooftop of the B&O station down at Utah Street. Out uh, behind the bleachers here at Camden Yards. And now I look back into the, the beautiful ballpark here. We got two ball clubs here with great new ballparks. Jacobs Field in Cleveland, one of the the outstanding new ballparks built. Coming up, four o'clock. Joey Hamilton and the Padres taking on Todd Stottlemyre and Tony La Russa's St. Louis Cardinals. And uh, it'll be interesting. You mentioned to Ray Langford. It'll be interesting to see what Langford's status will be 
for that ball game. That's coming up next on ESPN after our ball game here. And then later tonight at 8 o'clock, the Yankees and the Rangers. And that game will be seen on NBC. Kenny Lofton, he struck out his first time. A guy, the, despite all their power, Cleveland needs him to get on base and make things happen. It's a, a big part of their offense. Lofton scored 132 runs this year. And that's a strike, and it's 0-2 from David Wells. Seal again was playing very shallow at third base. Now with two strikes, he backs up a little bit. Two to one. The Orioles leading Cleveland in the third. And fastball missed. One ball, two strikes. Kevin Seitzer on deck. And then Jim Tomey for Cleveland. The top of the batting order here in the third inning. And he chased that high fastball. Got a piece of it this time. We mentioned what a bright sunshiny day it is. There's the the sky that the players are having to look up into whenever a ball is hit high in the air. We've seen several players have a problem with that already. It makes a big difference as an outfielder and also an infielder when pop-ups go up. It can make it uh, make it really tough to make a play. One and two the count. And there's one high in the air. Ripkin out. Sirhoff in. And Sirhoff. Again, Lofton kept off the base pass. Well, that's going to be a huge key for David Wells. We saw with Vizquel, who had the base stolen so easily, but overslid the bag. But if Wells can keep Lofton off base, that's going to go a long ways towards helping his club win today. I guess when you're a manager in big ball games like this, because the difference between clubs at this level is so slight, that that's a manager's worst nightmare, right? The little unforeseen things that happen. Like a guy stealing a base but sliding off the bag. I mean, how often does that happen? You almost never see it. Here's Seitzer, and he takes a strike. On an 0-2 pitch, he singled on a curveball in the left field his first time. He's one for one. Probably won't see that curveball again if he goes 0-2 on I guarantee it. <laughs> one strike the count to Seitzer. Two to one. Baltimore ahead. We're in the third inning. And a fastball away. One ball, one strike. Kevin Seitzer, I mean, he's been around a long while. Something that intrigued me is that, uh, oh, he's been around a long while. He can hit, man. I mean, uh, if you get a guy on second base, and Kevin's a, he's a prototype number two hitter, he's going to get that ball to right field to get that guy over and do his job, and uh, he's always been able to do that. Two and one. Well, again, the Indians last year in postseason, one and four against left-handers, and they appeared all year long to struggle with them. Seitzer hit 368 against lefties this year, and that's why John Hart went out and Made that deal. Tribe went 19 and 7 after they got Seitzer. And it is 3 and 1. Jim Tomey, the big left handed slugger, is on deck. There's Tomey. Zeal makes a long throw. And after the three and one pitch, turns into an easy out. Two men gone now with Tommy coming up. One of the key things for David Wells, first pitch strikes, eight out of the first 11 hitters. He has gone 0 and 1 on. I think he turned that pitch over a little bit on Kevin Seitz, looking for something to really juice right there, and uh, just took a little bit off of it, kind of faded it away from him. Some pitchers call it a batting practice fastball when they just know a hitter is all juiced up for that good heat. They just kind of throw in about 70 up there. Well, I I'll tell you what, it better be fading because if yep. it's out over the plate, he can be hurt by it. Here's Tommy. And he's hurt a lot of guys this year. 38 home runs. Struck out his first time today. And a fastball in there for a strike from Wells. As you can see Tommy right on top of the plate. I mean, this guy's back foot is almost touching the back. Almost touching the plate almost. Look at how close he is. It's kind of tough. He's kind of inviting you to, he dares you to throw inside, I guess. Too low. One ball, one strike to Jim Tomey. Many of these Cleveland players came up when this ball club was a bad ball club. Guys like Tomey, Albert Bell, uh, the former second baseman, Carlos Baerga, Sandy Alomar, although they picked him up in a trade, he came over when they were a bad ball club. 
Lofton came up onto the scene when they were a bad ball club. So it's a ball club that, although it has this uh, reputation, sort of a, a swashbuckling reputation of, of a lot of guys, a lot of, a lot of guys who caused a lot of trouble. I mean, it's a very close knit ball club in many ways. I mean, these guys have been together for a long time. It makes winning more gratifying when you lose after a while and then all of a sudden you win. It makes it, I think you appreciate it a lot more than you do. Charles Daggy was here in 1990, and of course, 91 was the year the Indians lost 105. So they, they went through a lot of struggles. And I guess, you know, I agree with Kirby. Once Sandy Alomar was here, he suffered through it. I guess when you reach the point where you become successful, you finally do walk with a little swagger. Two and two the count to Jim Tomey. Anderson will have to play it on the bounce base hit and that keeps the inning going for Albert Bell. See Tony's back foot right right on top of the plate and the ball inside he's so so big and strong just turns right on it and hits it right in the center field for base hit. Chieftain ain't going for this guy right here who can hurt you anytime any place anywhere. Albert Bell. And of course, uh, I mean, Albert's not just a guy up there swinging from the heels, trying to pull everything. I mean, a little home run to center field, the right center. This is the whole ballpark. It even makes him more dangerous. Say when between at bats, the Indians are in the dugout. Albert go back and look at the video machine of previous at bats, trying to get a little edge against the pitcher. Well, as a player, you want to keep that edge. Once you lose the edge, then you're not going to be any good anymore. So you have to be. It's a little bit better than everybody else. In order to keep that edge, is that's what Albert has to do to stay sharp and keep the edge. That's what he's going to continue to do. It also keeps a book not only on every pitcher he faces, but on every umpire and their tendencies behind home plate. I asked you before the game if you did that, and you went, "I'm up there hacking." Yeah, that's what I try to do. I go back to the old school, though. You know, when pitchers try to get ahead of you, you know, you're going to get something close to the plate. And a fastball for a strike on the inside. Albert didn't want to call the strikes in there. Because he usually don't let usually when you throw inside like that, he usually hits it out of the ballpark. So uh, I guarantee Wells won't come back in there again with that same pitch. One ball, one strike to Albert Bell. Two down, Tommy at first. We're in the third inning. It's Baltimore two, Cleveland one. See, Albert has had some success against Wells in the past. I think Albert's had success against a lot of people. Less against Wells than a lot. A high pop up. Back of third. Ripken comes over. Zeal and foul ground. Zeal. And that ends the inning. Albert Bell fouls out the third, leaving a man at first. Todd Zeal coming up, then Roberto Alomar and Rafael Palmero. Two to one, Baltimore. ESPN's coverage of the 1996 Major League Baseball Divisional Series continues now from Baltimore. Game one of this series and game one of the whole tournament and there's a called strike to Todd Zeal coming up at four o'clock it'll be the Padres and the Cardinals here on ESPN Chris Berman and Buck Martinez will be there to cover the action Todd Zeal flight out deep to left his first time and Nagy misses with one one ball one strike later tonight it'll be the Yankees and the Rangers pretty interesting series there David Cohn and John Burkett will duel at Yankee Stadium that'll be on NBC at eight o'clock tonight. And sinker misses inside. Two and one to Zeal. Charles Nagy, the ace right-hander for the Cleveland Indians, a 17-game winner, but he has given up a home run in each of the first two innings. This count gets to it. The throw, not in time. Well, again, it's very apparent that unless Omar Vizquel feels the ball cleanly, the weakness in the throwing shoulder, no chance to get zeal. I mean, Omar, at one time, when he's healthy, has a good arm. He doesn't come up with it cleanly. And then when he finally gets up, zeal a slow runner, but he just can't get enough on the throw. Yeah, he's out there playing with sure guts right now, and uh, shoulders hurt a little bit. But as you can see right there, Nagy, another curveball up in the zone. That he gave Zeal a chance to hit over there in the hole. And uh, it was a good try by Vizquel, but he just couldn't throw him out. Here's Roberto Alomar. Got an infield hit his first time. Fastball down and away. That's sinking fastball. One ball and no strikes. Kirby, you 
mentioned it for the very outset. One of the keys for Nagy, getting the ball down. And, the ball uh, down. Yep. Yeah, and that's we saw it there. I mean, that pitch was really up to Dezeal. Palmero on deck. And he misses outside of the fastball. Two and zero. Oh. Charles Nagy. A lot of people say he should be in contention for the Cy Young Award. And when asked about his season, he said, "Yes, a good year. But if I don't do well in postseason, people are going to forget how well I pitched during the season." No doubt about that. And it's two and one now to Alomar with Rafael Palmero coming up next. Alomar has had a, a history. You see Mark Wiley, the Cleveland pitching coach, and a former Orioles pitching coach. And there's a lot of uh, Baltimore influence in that Cleveland hierarchy. But uh, Alomar, when with Toronto, had a history of being at his very best in the postseason. There goes Zeal. Just a dribbler, Sandy Alomar throws out his younger brother Roberto as Zeal takes second. Well, again, the Orioles did not run much towards the end of the year, but we saw Alomar steal on a 3 0 count, saw a hit and run play there, so maybe Davey Johnson's <laughs> reverting back to National League Baseball here in the playoffs. Well, it might be a good idea, though, Dave, right? I mean, you expect, although they had all of these runs scored in the regular season, it's going to be a little tighter. A little lower scoring probably in the postseason. Well, everybody expecting it in the National League with the great pitching staffs over there, but in the American League, wondered if they felt the same way, but evidently Davey feels it's going to be a relatively low scoring game. And also, you got a guy coming up with 142 RBIs. We get him in scoring position for him. See you at second. One out. And Baltimore leading two to one. Palmero grinded out to second on a 3 0 pitch his first time. Maybe with Brady hitting 50 and Cal and Eddie 142. Jim Gentile back in 1961. And Palmero set the new record. And that sinker is low. Of course, 61 was the year when we had eight guys hit 40 or more home runs. Would we have 17 this year? Vinny Castillo becoming the 17th to do it. If you 17 like. with uh, 28 teams and eight that year with 18 teams. And that's a foul by Palmero. Hey, you tell you what, if you're an offensive-minded person, it was definitely your year to be to watch a lot of good baseball this year. If you like offense, if you like pitching, then you probably didn't want to watch much this year. Well, which do you like? Uh, <laughs> I like I like offense. <laughs> what a surprise! Well, I mean, uh, I mean, I think it's awfully nice to have two to one games when uh, every sometimes, but uh, I think people want to see action. See you in second. That one is hit deep and fouled on the right field line. And again, Kirby up. Up in the zone a little bit, yeah. Right. He has to keep that ball down. And uh, as you can see, when you get the ball up, he can get hurt. And uh, But I, I guarantee you right now, he's going to throw that ball away from, from Rafi right here and try to make him uh, pull a ground ball to second or something. And try to keep it down. See the Orioles with the league record. And uh, two other ball clubs broke the Yankees' old uh, home run record as well. Two and two. Side with the fastball up again, three and two the count. Amazing thing to me, Kirby, as you watch Palmero, is how effortless his swing seems. No, no wasted motion at all, his swing. Bobby Bonilla on deck. Runner in second, one out of the third. Nagy trying to hold the line here, already trailing two to one. Into right center, Ramirez back, it's over his head and going to the wall. Zeal will score. Palmero with a double. 3 1 Baltimore. You hear the word elevation a lot when they talk about Denver baseball, but it's also true for Charles Nagy at sea level basically here because he's elevating the ball and the Oriole hitters are not missing it. Mike Wiley on his way to the mound. That's the pitch again, the hanging fork ball it looked like, and Rafi just hit it right into uh, right into the right center field gap. It was definitely up in the zone. You have it, the ball up, you've done half the job with the hitter. He doesn't have to lift, he just has to make contact. That's right, and I'm sure if you ask Nagy about that pitch, he'd like to have it back. Well, Palmero, in addition to his 39 home runs, also had 40 doubles in the regular year. And, and you don't get 142 RBIs unless you bring in a lot of guys when they're out there at second base. But you got to be fortunate to have the ducks on the pond, as they say. And uh, had a guy in front of him that hit 50 home runs and scored 100 and some runs, and a guy hitting second 
that uh, also hit 20 some home runs and scored 130 times or whatever. So is Bonilla. And he takes ball one. Bonilla walked his first time. And again, first base is empty. And the right handed batting Ripken is on deck. And Bonilla, as Day pointed out the first time, has done well against Nagy. Five for eight lifetime. Pickoff coming with the Vizcal moving in behind the Palmero at second, but no throw. Nagy has labored here. 46 pitches. And Baltimore really has had a very considered approach. I mean, they've not been swinging a lot of bad balls. Often against uh, pitchers like Nagy, they did. That is a strike. One ball, one strike. Makes it kind of tough. I bet you Wally went out and told him that he had a base open uh, with the in and probably told him you got to get the ball down. I bet you that's what he told him. Good fastball on the outside. Strike two. Bonilla did not like the call. And fastball in, fastball away. Nagy this year has struggled a little bit against Cleveland, though. Against Baltimore, though, he has allowed 26 base hits in 17 innings. What do you think, Kurt? Strike? I mean, I'm a hitter, man. I was out. <laughs> was outside. An overhead shot. I saw you. I saw outside. you flinch when we saw Well, I, flashbacks. You know, I kind of get these flashbacks when I'm up here. And, uh, but I'm probably to call it a strike, and that's the good thing about baseball. If he calls it a strike, no matter where it's at, it's a strike. Rube Coble, the home plate umpire. Ooh. All right. Now, uh, what about that pitch then, Kirby? Well, uh, I've, I've been a long time since I've seen this many pitches. So <laughs> <laughs> that pitcher can't have both sides well, of the plate, right, Kirby? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what that, actually, that was a good pitch by Nagy. I, I could have sworn he was going to go away with that pitch, but he came back inside. Yeah, it looked pretty good too. It looked real good. And there's the splitter, but too low. Three and two now. Jabonia. Same count he had last time, and he threw him a 3 2 splitter down and away last time. Let's see if he changes his batter. He's got Benia thinking out there probably, but he also could pound him in with a fastball. There's Palmero at second. One out. 3 to 1, Baltimore ahead. Right back to Nagy. He looks Palmero back. Bonilla is retired. Out number two, and now Cal Ripken is coming up. Right. Palmero, by the way, you see him limping around a little bit. He's got a very bad left ankle. He thinks he hurt it against the Yankees two weeks ago. He's getting it uh, treated before every game. He's getting it heavily taped before every game. But he really has been hobbling out there, and it, it's it's ugly to look at. It's all swollen. But he's not able to take the time right now to, to let it heal up. No, not right now. You don't have a lot of time for healing right now. I think uh, if you don't have anything broken, you're going to be playing in these games right here. That's when they really count. So Ripken now with a man in scoring position. He grounded a short his first time. Uh, Palmer set up on the outside. That one came inside. One ball, no strikes. As you can see Nagy uh, missing a lot. He usually doesn't miss a lot. Usually when uh, Alomar sits outside, he throws it outside. So his uh, location was a little bit off today. But uh, here's Ripken hitting again with a new stance again. Every time I see Rip, he's got a new stance for him. So he's got a thousand of them. On the outside, nice pitch. One ball, one strike. Never ceases to amaze me. He has success one way, then all of a sudden, uh, if he gets three hits one way, he'll come back the next day and he'll change his stance. Uh, him and Ken Herbeck were the best guys I've, I, that I've ever seen to like change their stance overnight. I don't know about them, but me, if I get three hits, I know the next time I come up, I'm the next game, I'm batting the same identical way that I did the night before. And that's outside. Two on one to Cal Ripken. Palmero at second, two down. Eddie Murray on deck. It's going to be very important with that bad ankle of Palmero that he get a very aggressive lead. Manny Ramirez led the American League in assists this year. Lofton throws well in center field. And that's foul. Two and two now to Cal Ripken. It's a matter of Palmero, not a real speedy runner to begin with, but you can still be a good base runner even if you don't have great speed. You just got to lengthen your lead out a little bit and hope maybe Sandy Alomar isn't in a throwing mode to try to pick you off. That's one thing you can't do against Texas. For Pedro Rodriguez. And he is a weapon behind the plate. Count. That one came up and off of home plate and hit him. Wonder if he'll miss a game. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> I don't think there's anything to keep him out of a game. I think he'll uh, swing. He's out front of the four ball, comes back up and hits him. Two to Cal Ripken. 
played now in 2,316 consecutive games. He played 163 this year. The Orioles had a tie game with Texas. Did not count in the standings, but counted as game play. Two and two. Palmero in second, ready to go on anything. Down the left field line into the corner. Foul. Hit that one pretty well. Take a fastball away. It was up a little bit too, I'm sure. Ball up again. Rip just wrist it out there and just used those strong wrists of his and just foul. Would not stay fair for him. Look at Nagy. Nagy knows he wants to get the ball down and he's getting the ball up a lot. Two and two. Over the infield. Base hit. Palmero will score. Cal Ripken delivers another run. 4 1 Baltimore. Well, again, watch the height of the ball. It's a blue pit. He gets jammed, but when you get the ball up, then you can fist it over the infield. If the ball's down and you get jammed, it's a little weak grounder. So, again, Nagy is up as Cal just looked hopelessly on as Cal drives in a big run. Now, Eddie Murray. One ball and no strikes. Murray hit a little dribbler back to the pitcher his first time. He's 0 for 1. Started the year with Cleveland. And it was traded to Baltimore only after Mike Cargrove announced that Eddie was going to become a platoon player for Cleveland. And that's in there for a strike. One ball, one strike. And uh, Eddie was not too pleased with it, but it showed the popularity in his presence in the clubhouse when many of his teammates were outraged at what they perceived as, as an insult to Murray. It's out of play. One ball and two strikes now. Baseball, such a game of first. David Wells saw his team score first. We also talked about first pitch strikes. Wells is throwing nine out of 13 first pitch strikes. Charles Nagy, 11 out of 16 first pitch balls. He's been getting behind in the count. That makes hitters a lot better. That's off the outside. Two and two. Cleveland has the bullpen up now. Right handed Danny Graves, a rookie. Started warming up in the Cleveland bullpen. We're only in the third inning. This is not what Mike Hargrove had in mind. Ace right handed Charles Nagy. Giving up four runs and six hits. We're only in the third. Right to Franco at first base, and that will retire Murray and the Orioles. But two more runs for Baltimore. Three hits. Franco and then Ramirez coming up. ESPN's coverage of game one of the American League Division Series between Cleveland and Baltimore continues now. Top of the fourth inning. The Orioles four, Cleveland one. John Miller, Dave Campbell, and Kirby Puckett here with you. Joe Morgan will be back with us tomorrow. He's working the Yankee Ranger game tonight for NBC. That's an 8 o'clock uh, telecast on NBC. Coming up after our ball game, the Cardinals and the Padres will get underway in St. Louis at about 4 o'clock. And here's Ball one to Julio Franco. By the way, because of the delay here without the umpires being present, we had a delay here getting started. The starting time for game two of our broadcast day, the game in St. Louis will start now at 425, we've been informed. Here is Julio Franco with a one ball, one strike count. He flied out to right his first time. And then Manny Ramirez, who homered, is on deck. Jeff Kent do up third. David Wells. Goes to work now with a three run lead. But it's only the fourth inning. Facing one of the most prolific offensive ball clubs in the game, the Cleveland Indians. Oh, Franco lost the bat and it hits the roof of the Cleveland dugout third base side as he fouled that ball. And uh, the fans in the box seats and his own teammates were glad that it hit the roof. So was I. <laughs> Little fans in the front row are going, thank you so much. Well, as you know, Franco holds the bat. He holds down on the knob, and he only holds it. He's so strong with his only two fingers and his thumb. That's it. He doesn't have the, the ring finger and, and, and the little pinky holding the bat. So he's pretty strong, and he's holding, and he's pointing it at the pitcher. 
and therefore for slipped out his hand that time. Pretty long and heavy bat too. Fastball away. Full count now to Julio Franco. Or I beg your pardon. Two balls, two strikes to Julio Franco. See Nagy, as Dave was pointing out, has started behind almost every hitter. Wells has started ahead of most of the hitters on his side. It's a high foul. It will go back out of play. And the count is two and two. John, we talk about this can be such a complex game, but when you break it down to its simplest element, if you score first, if you retire the first batter in the inning and you throw first pitch strike, you're going to win about 90% of the time. It's too simple for me. <laughs> Roberto Alomar in second drops and picks it back up. Plenty of time. Franco had hamstring problems all year long, not running well, so Alomar had uh, more than adequate time to just recover and throw him out there. One down. Well, one thing is uh, Cleveland, uh, I know these last couple of years, had a great comeback ball club, last year in particular. And this Baltimore club has had uh, many tremendous comebacks this year. Maybe their biggest one was 51 and 52 on July 28th, and it, they were 10 out behind the Yankees. They'd been swept after the All Star game. That's not just a game, that's a season they came back from. Ended up 12 back of the Yanks almost by the end of July, and eventually got as close as two and a half before the Yanks picked it up at the end, took a series from the Orioles two weeks ago in New York, and uh, won the division. The Orioles uh, came back. To gain the wild card bird. Ramirez, who homered his first time, and he shoots one right past Wells. He is two for two, a base hit for Ramirez. Fourth hit for Cleveland. Second base. Nelson over to talk to Manny Ramirez at first base. But we saw how Charles Nagy squares off. He's a good fielding pitcher. Wells falls off the mound. You, you can help yourself if you can field your position, but if you fall off that mound, you're going to be in trouble. Think on that play right there. Good field or not. I just thank God it didn't hit him because that would have hurt right there. That ball, even your best fielders wouldn't have caught that one, I don't think. Yeah, John, one guy who's not even on the Orioles postseason roster, Rip Tripton, may have pitched the biggest game all year for Baltimore. Not only did he win, but it allowed Davey Johnson to go back to that, you know, five, four full days rest. This past Wednesday, the Orioles had been stumbling. They were in Boston facing the, the red hot Red Sox and Crimpton. The young lefty got charged with pitching a very big ball game, and he pitched beautifully, and they won the game. Seen right here on ESPN, six to two last Wednesday night against the knuckleballer Tim Wakefield, and many really thought ahead of time it was the biggest game of the year, and he came through beautifully. But he's not on the postseason roster. He wasn't active when the rosters were frozen at the end of August. And he was in the clinch, the wild card on Saturday in Toronto. Enabling Wells to make the first game start here. And it's a strike to Jeff Kent. Rounded a third his first time. One out, one on, fourth inning. Four to one Orioles. We talked at the beginning about how on paper everything looked like Cleveland in this game. Their best pitcher, Nagy. Wells had been struggling terribly, but this would be a tremendous lift for the Orioles if Wells could give them six or seven, and then Davy Johns can utilize that eight man bullpen. Eight man bullpen and get the matchups he wants. He's got a lot of lefties and righties down there, so they're going to be specialists in the series. The Orioles bullpen, a much behind group much of the year. Rocky Coppinger there, number 27, was a starter in his rookie year. And he's out in the bullpen now as well. To give them eight men out there. Up and in to Kent. One ball and one strike. Sandy Alomar is on deck. And there's Davy Johnson. Doing a little uh, extracurricular reading. Well, he's uh, got the lead here. Now that's relaxation, Kurt. <laughs> Doesn't look too worried to me. I think that uh, he was losing. I don't think he'd be reading that. I don't think. So Wells has always done well against Cleveland. That is a fair ball. Headed for the left field corner. Sirhoff up with it. Kent heading for second. In there with a double. Ramirez stopping at third. A long way to go yet in this ball game, and 
if you're the Cleveland Indians, you, you might well look at it. Well, they've only got a three run lead against it. I mean, Cleveland scores a lot of runs. What a pitch from Wells. It was a good pitch, fastball inside, right? What Ken yeah, sure. the, put a good swing on it and didn't hook it enough. It just stayed fair by, by, by plenty of plenty of feet, plenty of room down there. And, uh, Got a double out of it. I mean, it's only the fourth inning, man. This game got a long way to go, and uh, I think it's going to be a lot more run scored than people think today. But we'll have to stay tuned to watch. All right. Well, we'll stay. Okay. I'll you stay, and we'll stay. I'll stay. We've got a commitment now. Kirby will stay the rest of the day. One out, runners at second and third. Here's Sandy Alomar, and it's ball one. Suddenly, Wells not starting ahead of every hitter. A little tentative after that shot by Ramirez back through the middle, and then fastball Kent turned on very well. Omar Vizcal is on deck. The infield stays back, normal depth. And a pop foul off the first base side. One ball, one strike. Radar reading at 91, so Wells still has good pop on the fastball. ESPN in the postseason, and we'll have you covered through the postseason. Back here in Baltimore tomorrow at 1 o'clock. We'll have a, a ball game from Dodger Stadium at 4 o'clock tomorrow, as well as uh, coverage by NBC and Fox in the primetime hours. That is a base hit. Sandy Alomar over the head of brother Roberto. Kent will be held at third, but with the high throw by Bonilla, good base running. Sandy Alomar takes second base. That's a bad throw there by Bobby. Uh, as any outfielder knows, what you're supposed to do is uh, hit the cutoff man. And I think what he tried to do was hit the cutoff man and maybe do a little bit too much, but uh, let Alomar get in scoring position. I think he should have just kept. Well, especially with the two-run lead after the runner scores, you got to keep the double play in order. Keep the double play in order. That's right. Bobby Bonilla comes in. He makes a good play in the half hop. But when Sandy Alomar sees this ball air mailing. Rafael Palmero wisely goes to second and Hoyles has no chance. Look at Sandy. He reads that right away with a high throw. That's what you taught us when you hit the ball like that. And if the outfielder doesn't hit the cutoff, man, it just keep going. And uh, Bobby's hoping right now that it doesn't cost him, but a base hit right here can tie up the game. That's right. So now both men in scoring position. Omar Vizcal, the hitter. Zeal shallow at third. Palmero pulled in at first. The middle infielders are deep. And that's a foul out of play. Vizcal. Walked his first time. Now, had the Bonilla hit his cutoff man and can't hit, held you Sandy out on the first base, they'd be in a spot where a double play would end the inning. No doubt about it. That drives managers and coaches nuts right there, that play that Bobby just made. But you know what you have to understand is that we're all human, and it's happened to all of us that, that actually got a chance to play the game at one point or another. Don't tell me, Kirby, tell him. Uh, no, I'm not telling anybody. Tell Davey. I don't play anymore. <laughs> Two clean. There's strike two to Biscal. Remember, Biscal only one for 23 in his career against David Wells. Jeff Kent at third base, Sandy Alomar at second base. There's Kent, and there's Sandy. A base hit to the outfield could tie this game. 0 oh and 2 to Biscal. Kenny Lofton is on deck. Inside. One and two now. But you can see Wells trying to pound Vizcal in, I think, trying to keep the ball in on his hands, maybe. It's always an important inning, too, after your team has extended the lead. The Orioles came in 4 1 going to the fourth. Wells doesn't want to give it right back here. That's discouraging to his team. Well, still peering in at Hoyles. Now Vizcal backs away for a moment. has now thrown 70 pitches and we're only in the top of the fourth inning. One out. They swing. The appeal no, says Greg Kosk, the first base umpire. Two and two the count now. Well, the rule of thumb always on a switch hitter who doesn't have big power, and Vizcal fits that mode. He's got some, but you pound him in, especially with two strikes, because they're trying to find a way. He didn't go. Call by the first base umpire Greg Cost. See if he stays in on him right here or he tries to go away from him. Get at third base. Sandy Alomar at second. He went away that time and Vizquel 
It's hit foul into the second deck. Two and two. I haven't seen much of David Wells's changeup today, which he has one of the better ones. He's probably gone probably about 75 to 80 percent fastballs this afternoon. I don't know that you'd want to throw a changeup to this Kel unless you think you've really got him to speed up his bat with all the fastballs you've thrown him. That fastball and he did hit it hard but foul. I got to see change up here. He threw a fastball. Omar opened up. Kirby, you're shaking your head no, <laughs> but I, I I think you've got his bat speeded up a point. If you can go, well, if you can go down and away with a change up. You can get him. Well, you might have a good point, but what if he throws a change up and then he hits it hard, so he makes mistakes and hang it. I think that uh, right here he should go with his best pitch to get on Omar out, and I think he's going to come back inside right here. I could be wrong. I'm wrong a lot, but let's see what happens. A fastball, but away. Two and two. Yeah, there's two rules of thought. I mean, you never want to do what you call a punch in Judy, although I think Omar has become a little better than that with that 297 average. You don't like to throw them soft stuff, but if they start turning and whipping your best inside fastball in the seats down there, then you've got to maybe rethink. Well, 297, there's no such thing as a punch in Judy at 297. Cannon third, Adam on at second, one out. And again. He punches it foul. Speaking of which, two and two the count to Omar Vizquel. I still think he's going to come inside here at some point. I don't think he's going to go through a change up, David. I could be wrong. Well, he, he certainly hasn't shown any inclination to. I don't think he's going to go back, coming back inside right here. He sets up inside. Inside fastball popped up foul. Oil's coming back, but it is in amongst the spectators. Two and two. There's Kent. The one on one on. He hit a double. There's Alomar, who then singled home Ramirez and took second himself. And Bonilla's ill advised throw all the way through to the plate. Wells has thrown 22 pitches in this inning, and every one of them a fastball. Not just to Vizcal, but to everyone. This count is the fifth batter of the inning. One run in, four to two. The Orioles leading the Indians. Two men on, one man out. Right field. Tagging at third is Kent. Shallow right, Bonilla. Kent's going to test it. The throw. And Orioles misses it. Holding it second was Sandy Alomar, and it is four to three for the Orioles. Bonilla's throw got one of those. In between hops and Hoyles couldn't handle it. Now Bobby Benilla sets up very well on this. Gets all the momentum coming towards the plate. They've got him. If Hoyles can come up with this throw, but it hit a little bit too close to him and can't in. That's a tough. That's a tough play for a catcher, but. Uh... Well, he probably should have came up with that throw right there. David Johnson watching the play as it happened. It's a good play by David Wells to be bagging up on that play also. So four to three now. Here's Lofton and a base hit could still tie them to the ball game. And that one is caught by Ripken. Hit hard by Lofton, but Ripken was there. So Cleveland draws back to within one. Four to three Baltimore. ESPN's coverage of the 1996 Divisional Series continues now from Baltimore. It is four to three for the Orioles. And uh, at least in the early going here, we're only in the last of the fourth inning. Looks like one of those typical Orioles Indians games. A lot of offense as B.J. Sirhoff fouls one away against Charles Nagy. One ball, one strike. Sirhoff homered. You saw that home run swing there a moment ago. Brady Anderson also a home run for Baltimore. Ramirez has homered for Cleveland. Sirhoff, the eighth place hitter in the order. Hit 292 in the regular year. That one's just off the corner. Two and one. He'll be followed by Chris Oyles and then leadoff man Brady Anderson for Baltimore. Four to three for the Orioles. Both pitchers have labored here in the early innings. Lofton into shallow center field. And that is out number one. So Surhoff is gone. Now Hoyles will come up. The umpires are here. The regular Major League umpires. They arrived to the ballpark about 10 minutes before 1 o'clock here in Camden Yards. Drew Coble 
is the crew chief and apparently as we understand it that there is uh, no agreement between uh, the umpires in Major League Baseball no injunction has been issued but the umpires have agreed to work today and tomorrow uh, today and tomorrow only at this point they've uh, talked about uh, having a hearing regarding Roberto Alomar's status this Thursday and strike one to Chris Hoyles so at this point the umpires will work all the games today and tomorrow and then it's supposed to be a hearing on Thursday and then hopefully a decision will be made and uh, the games will continue back in 1972 in the American League Championship Series Campy Campaneras the Oakland A's shortstop threw a bat at Laren Legron Tigers pitcher Campaneras got a 10 game suspension however most of it was served the next year yeah, but they the series then moved from Oakland to Detroit Boyles got hit by that pitch brushed him on the shirt apparently so he'll go down to first base and Brady Anderson will come up well, John I'm just wondering if maybe they would have given Roberto a longer suspension than five games that it maybe it wouldn't have been such a big issue I don't know I mean we remember Pete Rose getting the 30 games for bumping Dave Pallone and I mean guys are getting 10 games for having attack in their glove or a court bat this seemed a little more serious than that to me yeah I mean uh, plus the, the suspension I mean they give the suspension the players have a hearing if they appeal it and then suspensions often get made into a, a smaller period of time that was the case with Albert Bell when he was uh, caught with a court back a couple of years ago Anderson in the left field but there's Bell with a slide and a catch that one was falling quickly and Albert got to it nice play two down but he always talks about average bat I guess he shows right here that uh, has a glove also that ball slicing away from the left field coming up Brady's Brady's bad and you see it dying and all of a sudden he speeds up right here sees it dying it's a good play by Albert yeah the key was he got a terrific jump on the ball so Albert takes a base hit away from Brady Anderson big out here in the fourth inning but in 72 as you see zeal with Oakland heading to Detroit they decided that for Campanera's own safety he should not play in Detroit I mean he had picked up a bat and thrown it like a like a, a sledgehammer at uh, Laren Legron. But then Oakland made the World Series. Campanaris played the whole World Series, and the rest of his 10 game suspension was served the following year. And the baseball's contention is that players don't serve these kind of suspensions in postseason because it's more of a, a penalty to the team rather than the individual. But uh, again, I'm, I'm with you, Dave. I think if they'd made the penalty more severe in the first place, even though it was appealed and held off till later, that this might not have happened. There's a base hit. But Todd Zeal boils to second base. And that keeps the inning going for Roberto Alomar. Well, as Kirby said, you start the batting average over in postseason. Todd Zeal was one for 38, two for three today. And the Cleveland bullpen is going to get busy again. And uh, for that matter, the Orioles bullpen is busy. Alomar has an infield single and he has bounced out in front of the plate. A slider from Nagy for a strike. Pretty big play by Albert Bell now, especially with a hit by Zeal. Every play is big in these games, guys. You know that, don't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, and one the count to Alomar. Nagy lost it, regains it, and throws him out. And Nagy, after Cleveland had come surging back into the game, shuts down the Orioles. Seitzer, Tomey, and Bell coming up. Four to three Orioles. Seitzer. Orioles four, Indians three as we head to the top of the fifth. Here at Camden Yards, Baltimore. Well, we talked about David Wells falling off the mound. Watch Charles Nagy's feet. When he lands, he's going to really help himself as he feels this ball back through the middle. Saves a base hit and a run. He fielded 1,000 this year, but look how his feet are squared off, and then he makes the play on Roberto Alomar. You can't do that if you're falling off the mound. So Nagy helps himself. No way does Vizquel get to that ball. David Wells, who really 
labored hard in that fourth inning. Comes back down with a one run lead. And the Orioles bullpen is busy. Kevin Seitzer at the plate, then Jim Tomey and Albert Bell. The power coming up for Cleveland here in the fifth inning. And that's a foul back to the screen. One ball, one strike. Rocky Coppinger, the big Orioles rookie right hander. Won 10 ball games, mostly as a starter. Only appeared one time as a reliever during the season after being called up. He's in the bullpen now. The Orioles will. Most likely go with three starters in this five game series, or best of five game series with Cleveland. Saints are one for two in the game. Fastball, a call, strike two. Wells has now thrown 81 pitches in this game. So you see that it's almost uh, all fastball. Seven out of eight have been fastball. What's that? 85 to 90 percent of his pitches have been fastball. I guess he figures with that extra day, a couple of days rest he had, and plus he was getting shelled his last three starts, it was time to revamp. It's funny though, I mean, you, you talk to a guy like, say, Tommy John, who had the great sinker, Scott McGregor, used to be with the Orioles. They tell you, uh, many games, they, they throw 90% fastball, but their fastball was sinking and moving and diving. I mean, he just throwing a good live fastball. And he struck him out with a fastball. You don't see Sicer swinging many high fastballs, but uh, coming from Wells, you know, coming from right handed hitter to left handed and got those 90 miles an hour, it's kind of hard to lay off that pitch. Once you make up your mind to swing, it's kind of tough to stop in the middle. Third strikeout for Wells, but his first since the first inning. The last guy he had struck out was this guy, Jim Tomey, back in the first. Tomey then singled in the third. He's one for two. Why not? Nobody on. Fifth inning. Orioles four, Indians three. Center field. Surhoff. Two men gone. He had a long run for that one, but he got there. That brings up Albert Bell. Well, we talk about Albert Bell keeping a book on hitters. It appeared on the 1 0 pitch last time. Bell was looking away to try to go to right. He was fooled, but the next pitch, he said, You're not getting back in my kitchen again, but. That's a pitch that Albert usually hammers. He popped that one up. David Wells with a one run lead now facing one of the great sluggers in the game today Albert Bell. Albert safe on the error by Zeal in the first inning. And then he fouled out to Zeal in the third inning on that last swing we just saw. So Albert is 0 for 2. Two down nobody on here in the fifth. Wells has not had a three up and three down inning yet. Neither, of course, is Nagy. Nagy just finally kept Baltimore for scoring, or, or from scoring for the first time in the fourth inning. John, also, you talking to you last night, you said B.J. Suroff did a nice job in left field. He got a terrific jump there. That was a big play. He's played a lot of, in the outfield in the past with the Brewers. He knows uh, how to move out there. Albert Bell. And that's low. One ball, no strikes. What do you think Albert's looking for? Something in or away? I know he's looking to drive one somewhere. <laughs> well, I'll tell you the truth. I think he's looking for something right down the middle of the plate here, but Wells is going to do his best not to try to lay it down the middle, try to stay out of his zone a little bit, and maybe keep it away or run it hard inside. Well, there's a curveball. And we, we thought he'd never throw another curveball. Well, we, we, we said the sights are on 0 2 pitch. He'd never see that again, but. Albert hasn't seen that today, so that's a new pitch for Albert. See, just a little something to get him to take a look at and think about maybe as a hitter. But Albert has his mindset. He's looking for one thing here, especially heading to count two and zero, oh, trying to get something to drive. Broken bat, Zeal. Over the focus of the ball is the batman hurtling down the third base line. Three up and three down. We're halfway through it. Palmero, Bonilla, Cal Ripken coming up. Orioles four, Indians three. Four to three Orioles game one of the division series the Orioles and the Cleveland Indians John Miller Dave Campbell and Kirby Puckett who was just recognized by stadium announcer Rex Barney here at Camden Yards and received a standing ovation from this uh, Orioles crowd as Rafael Palmero stands in takes outside ball one but Kirby you never got a chance to make your farewell tour like guys who retire from the game 
Well, no, I didn't get a chance, but uh, you know, that's irrelevant to me. I don't have to do that. You know, I, I feel as though I, when I played the game, I played hard, John, and uh, that, that's what I live with every day. I mean, when I played, I played hard every single day. So therefore, that's what keeps me going every day. Well, and they appreciated that, I think, in, in cities all around the game, and uh, they certainly appreciated it here in Baltimore, as evidenced by this ovation he just received. Uh, very nice. And Rafael Palmero, Bobby Bonilla, and Cal Ripken. Uh, uh, looked up as well and uh, my buddy. greetings too. I'm my buddy. See, they come to my tournament in the wintertime, see, it's in November. So they they talk a lot. I talked to him before the game. Palmero, fly ball in the left center. Lofton is over. And Palmero is retired. Kirby Puckett was recognized on the stadium announce system. And uh, Acknowledging the cheers of the crowd, the whole ballpark stood up, cheered Kirby, and everybody, their attention directed this way. Look at the bright side, too, Kirby. You're getting better looking every day. <laughs> well, I, I thank God every day I don't get paid for my looks, Dave. That's the truth. <laughs> I'd never eat. Here's Bobby Bonilla. And that's a foul. Bonilla has walked and gone back to the pitcher. Bobby looked on that pitch. Ball turned away from him. He's still trying to pull the ball. Four to three. Ball more ahead. Lines to the fifth. Well, he's chased a, a bad one there. Well, I've never chased a bad one, so I don't, I don't know what you mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the hardest pitch in the world, right there, to lay off of. Though. I'm telling you, as a hitter, it's a high fastball. You're one of those Bible hitters. I shall not pass. You are hacking. Well, that's what I got paid to do, Dave. You know, you get paid to do a certain thing. That's what you do. And I knew my job was to drive in runs when I played, and uh, that's what I tried to do. One and two to Bonilla. And two and two. Oh, Nagy. And David Wells trying to settle in a little bit here. Both shaky in the early innings. Nagy allowed one run in the first, one run in the second, and two in the third. But he set the Orioles down, stranding two in the fourth. And he strikes out Bonilla. That is his first strikeout of the game. That's Charles Nagy's first. He finished 10th in the league this year with 167, so it is a little bit unusual. It looked like he finally started to get the ball down, especially to Bonilla in that bat. Two down, now Cal Ripken. Now Cal drove in the run that has the Orioles leading right now. A two out single to left in the third, just over the head of the shortstop. He is one for two. Up the middle, he is two for three. Hit number eight for Baltimore against Nagy. And it keeps the inning going for Eddie Murray. See, Dave, what's wrong with that swing by Cal right there? He went up there and swung at the first pitch. Right. Low. Pitch was low, too. Right where Nagy wants it. It's a good pitch, but you got to give a hit of credit sometimes. And right there, uh, Cal hit it right back up the middle. So Cal at first, and here's Murray. Eddie Murray, 40 years old. Now, how much has he slowed down, Kirby? Well, I think over a period of time we all slow down a certain amount, but uh, Eddie's still capable of hitting 20 home runs a year, even though he's 40 years old, 20 or more. So uh, I don't think he, he don't think he run like he used to, and things like that. But neither can he. None of us here in the ballpark. I mean, the younger you are, the you got a lot of energy. But when you get older, it's just the way it is. It's inevitable. It happens to all of us. You know, John, the 3,000 hits and the 500 home runs, so impressive, but. I look at the one number 75 RBIs at least 20 consecutive years. That is one production. Outside, one ball, one strike. And he set a record for that. I mean, 20 consecutive years. Hank Aaron did it 19 consecutive years. That had been the record. And Murray was proud of that because there had been years interrupted by strikes where he didn't get the full season to drive in runs and still kept the record going. That shows that shows the one thing of consistency. Jeff Kent throws out Murray. Murray now 0 for 3. Julio Franco and then Manny Ramirez coming up for Cleveland. 4 to 3 Baltimore. Here is Julio Franco. Find to right, grind to the second, facing David Wells. And that's a called strike. We've got a boomer here at ESPN. Chris Berman. And David Wells is the Orioles boomer. Every guy named uh, Wells, the nickname is Boomer, isn't it? 
That's what it seems like. Or Digger. <laughs> David Wells in the sixth inning. Now he just had his first three up and three down inning. Franco the hitter, Ramirez on deck. Franco chases one. Two strikes to count. Well, both pitchers starting to rebound from some shaky innings. Nagy, last two innings, is throwing seven out of nine first pitch strikes. And Wells, after a very tough fourth inning, came out and retired Seitzer, Tomey, and Bell in the fifth. One and two. Shut out innings after really struggling the first three. The last two innings he's been throwing strikes. He was off the first three innings. And the Orioles uh, took advantage of it. Brady Anderson, BJ Surhoff, home runs for Baltimore. Palmero and Ripken RBIs. Ramirez a home run for Cleveland. Alomar and Vizquel RBIs for Cleveland. The Indians with one in the second, two in the fourth. The Orioles, one in the first, one in the second, two in the third. Four to three for the Orioles. We play the sixth. One and two the count. Broken bat. Ripken it short. And there's one away. Franco ran pretty well on that one. Just amazing as you watch Cal. He knows every hitter in this league so well. He knows just how much he has to put on the throw at any given time. He probably ran down there a few times thinking you're going to beat one out against him, and the old half step got you. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's the way he plays. But I mean, you still have to go down there hard just in case. You know, accidents do happen, and uh, doesn't make many. That's why he plays every day. Cal Ripken with uh, 14 errors this year, but not every day at shortstop. For a week, he played third base for the Orioles for the first time since 1982, and then uh, right back to shortstop. Ramirez. A homer and a single, but this was a pop fly. Bonilla. Two men gone. Two down, nobody on. Coming up Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific, it's opening night action for the National Hockey League for the defending Stanley Cup champion, Colorado Avalanche, taking on the St. Louis Blues. The Avalanche led by playoff MVP Joe Sackick and their outstanding goaltender, Patrick Waugh. That's the Avalanche and the Blues Friday at 8 Eastern right here on ESPN. Patrick Wah. Nice. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Kent. He has grounded to third and he has doubled as part of that uh, Cleveland fourth inning rally. First ball swinging. High in the air. Shallow left center. Sirhoff. Makes eight in a row retired by David Wells and only six pitches thrown in this inning for him. Surhoff coming up for Baltimore. The Orioles ahead. From downtown Baltimore, Camden Yards. The division series, game one, the Indians and the Orioles. And uh, Baltimore leading four to three as we go to the last of the sixth inning coming up later. Actually now a 425 start. The Padres and the Cardinals from Bush Stadium, Joey Hamilton, Todd Stottlemyer. At 8 o'clock tonight from Yankee Stadium on NBC, the Rangers with John Burkett, the Yankees, and David Cohn. And then tomorrow, we'll be right back here. Joe Morgan will be back with me at 1 o'clock Eastern, the Indians and Orioles on ESPN. The Braves Dodgers play game one of their series at 4 Eastern on ESPN. And then the Rangers and Yankees game two, and that will be seen on Fox tomorrow night at 8. Here is B.J. Surhoff, and he looks at a cold strike from Charles Nagy. And, uh, as he was not doing in the early going, Nagy is starting hitters with strikes now. That's foul off the left field line. Well, he brought it up earlier. Five out of the first 16 hitters he faced were first pitch strikes, 11 not, and now he has gone eight of 10 getting ahead of the hitters. And it changes a, a lot of things. Now, all of a sudden, the last couple of innings seem like we've seen the Orioles. Swinging at more bad balls, looking a little more impatient, but they're, they're behind when they're swinging at these pitches now. I might have even hit 250 if I had a 2 0 count on me all the time. <laughs> Nagy going to have to hurry. He got it. Nice play by Nagy. 
So Sirhoff now one for three is one hit a home run back in the second. Well again Charles Nagy. You can help yourself win ball games if you can field your position. He has not made an error all year. He already saved one run. Got his hop out of the way. Technically very sound on that play. Maggie has now thrown out four runners. So he's he's been busy out there. Here's Chris Hoyles, right-handed hitter, popped to second, and he's been hit by a pitch. The ninth place hitter in the Orioles' batting order. Brady Anderson, the leadoff man on deck. Fastball too high for Nagy. Four to three, Baltimore ahead. The Cleveland bullpen is very busy here as we play the sixth inning. Charles Nagy, the last couple of innings, seems to really be settling in now. But so too has David Wells the last couple. And that slider in there for a strike. One ball and one strike. John, for whatever reason, people who watch pitchers on a regular basis say the guys that throw sinker balls usually finish in an excellent fielding position. The power pitchers are the guys that usually end up falling off the mound. They have to put so much more into their deliveries. Two and one now to Hoyles in the bullpen. The right-hander is Paul Shuey, and the left-hander is Alan Embry, and both are real hard throwers. Two and one to Hoyles. That one, three and one. Look at that. I think his eye even gets better right here. I'm sure the Hoyles is up here in this situation, hitting the count three and one. He's looking for a fastball right here. He can drive. He got one. Is it going to stay fair? Foul ball. Well, he got what he was looking for. Just a little bit out front. But it was pretty close. Here's a look. Just missed. Three and two to Hoyles. One out, nobody on. In the last of the sixth. And the fourth ball, did he swing? No. Greg Cross denying the appeal. So Hoyles gets the one, the one out walk. The uh, second walk allowed by Nagy. And it will bring up Brady Anderson. Now, Anderson, since his leadoff home run in the first inning, has flied out to right center and flied out to shallow left. Anderson, in addition to uh, hitting the 50 home runs this year, also had 92 extra base hits, which is a club record. Not, not much like a leadoff man with those kind of numbers. Here's Mike Hargrove. And he's, uh, I'm sure, keeping a, a very discerning eye on Nagy right now. As he's up around 100 pitches. And in fact, right at 100 pitches. In the left center field. That's in there. Base hit. Lofton makes a great play to keep it from bouncing right past him. Then makes a wild throw trying to throw in behind Hoyles. And Nagy again, who is an excellent fielder, showed pretty good quickness getting to that one. A good play of Nagy doesn't back up right there. It could have been a disaster. You know, Brady went deep to right field his first time up, but figuring Nagy's going to stay away from him, he's gone the other way his last two times up. Lofton sees the wide turn by Hoyles. Air mails Jeff Kent, but again, Nagy there. So, Charles, the best thing he's done today is field his position. Well, now, Mark Wiley is coming out to visit that man, Charles Nagy. Nagy has not had a three up and three down inning yet today. He has now given up nine hits in the ball game. And you see Shuey the right hander and Embry the left hander warming up in that Cleveland bullpen. And although the Cleveland bullpen has been a little bit different this year, it is still a real strength for this ball club. It's one of the best bullpens in the league. Well, Julian Tavares a year ago was the main setup guy, pitching nine out of 12 postseason games with a 2-6 ERA, but he really had a disastrous year, which included a trip to Buffalo. So Mike hasn't had quite that luxury. His main setup guys are Asenmacher and Plunk, but that comes around the seventh or eighth inning. And we're just in the sixth. Well, Yankee fans know full well the, the great season by Mariano Rivera up there in New York. 
last year Tavares did that job for Cleveland and did it almost as well. That's how valuable he was. But that was last year. Well, here's Todd Zeal. Zeal, oh, for his last 29 to end the year today. In the postseason, he's two for three. He just didn't waste him, I guess. <laughs> two men on. One man out, and it's ball one to Zeal. Well, Todd's got to look for a ball up here. He is a double play candidate if he hits it on the ground. He wants to try to force Nagy to get the ball up so he can drive it to the outfield. Nagy in a jam, Zeal at the plate. Roberto Alomar on deck. Hoyles at second, Anderson at first. And a foul ball comes back out of play. One and one now to Todd Zeal. He got an infield hit in the third, starting a two run rally. And he got a two out single in the fourth. He goes to fight out deep to left. Shuey and Embry watching the action from the bullpen. They've been ready now. Okay. Occasionally throwing a pitch. Down and in. Two and one to Todd Zeal. Well, again, David Johnson has not exercise the running game very much late in the season with all this power but if you were ever going to do it Zeal a pretty good contact hitter Hoyles doesn't run well though Zeal would have to put it in play hit and run time slider off the outside three and one well, that's about as tight a spot as you can get if you're Nagy well, there's no secret now Nagy definitely has to throw a strike right here he knows that this could be his last pitch right here if he doesn't uh Foul. Kept the ball down. Pretty good pitch. No, it, they didn't run two and one. They didn't run three and one. And now it's three and two. Hargrove, Davy Johnson. Hargrove's wondering about how much longer Nagy can go. Davy Johnson wondering if his ball club can extend its lead. There's Hoyles in second. Anderson at first. The crowd is on its feet now. The runner's not going. Down the line, foul. Hit hard again by Zeal, but foul again. Zeal was the cleanup hitter for the Phillies for the first five months of the year and led them in RBIs with 80. So he knows all about RBI situations. Well, Davey must be afraid of the strikeout, but Hoyles in second. Otherwise, he would start him. Jammed it. Pitch up. Zeal found it off again. Still three and two. I'm wondering if that's because of that fork ball. I mean, he's, uh, with that fork ball, always a threat to get the strike out. Well, in this situation, he knows that if he hits it on the ground, it could be a double play. You got to just make him get the ball up. Hopefully, he'll make a mistake here. Whoa! Nagy can't believe it. He comes storming off the mound after Drew Coble. That was called ball four. Look at a hard road. Doing a slow burn over there in the dugout. Looking like a pretty close pitch. Nagy thought it was in there. Hargrove thought it was in there. But Todd Zeal, he took it. Nerves of nerves of steel to take that one. And that puts Nagy out of the game. Base is loaded with one out. Roberto Alomar coming up. And in from the bullpen. A change for Cleveland. Nagy talking to himself as he leaves. The young hard throwing lefty, Alan Embry, comes on to face Roberto Alomar with Palmero behind him and the bases loaded. And only one man out for Baltimore here in the sixth inning. Charles Nagy, none too pleased as he left. He actually got into a, an argument with Drew Coble after the, being taken out of the game. Well, this pitch is awfully close. It's not where Alomar catches it. It's where it crosses the plate. And Nagy was already out of the game, but he's just asking Drew. He said, man, I got to have that pitch. And Coble said no. And Hargrove wants to make sure that Nagy doesn't get to maybe miss another game. 
Roberto Alomar switch hitter batting right handed. Shallow right center. Tagging at third is the slow footed Hoyles. And the throw comes in to shortstop. Hoyles scores. Hoyles, one of the slowest men in the league. And Ramirez with the great arm, and he threw to shortstop. Well, Five Manny, to three, Baltimore. Manny Ramirez leads the American League in assists, but sometimes he makes a lot of mental errors. He's got to know who that runner is at third. Chris Oils, the play has to be at the plate. There's no doubt about it. He has to know that Chris Hall isn't running there. He has to know who's on base and what are his chances. And he was coming in on the ball right there, and he probably should have threw home. So, uh, a little lapse on Manny's part. So a run is in for Baltimore. Five to three for the Orioles. In the last of the sixth, and here is Palmero, the fourth leading RBI man in the league in the regular year. Two on, two on. Oh, now that's the heat. Yeah, Embry throws pretty hard, Mill, I'll tell you that much. Anderson still at second base. Seal still at first base. Ramirez made sure they didn't move up. <laughs> Alan Embry, the hard throwing lefty. But he really, and just the one pitch, just that good hard fastball. Very high. One ball, one strike. Palmero has faced Embry four other times and is 0 for 4 and has struck out twice. You see, Palmero really had a breakthrough year this year for RBIs. Five to three, Baltimore, last of the six. Two on, two on. And it goes to two and one. Rafi had enough RBIs for three guys. <laughs> well, Charles Nagy out of the ball game. The Cleveland A's, he gave up five runs, or so far five. The two base runners belong to him. And a high foul that will come back out of play. Two and two to Palmero. As you can see, those nemesis is coming in the shadow in the batter's box, and uh, it makes it that much tougher on a hitter to pick up the spin on the ball once that shadow gets in there. So uh, hitters might have to go to the curry pocket theory here and be hacking quite a bit here early in the count, put the ball in play. Because if you fall behind, tough to pick up the pitch. Two and two. Bases are loaded and Bobby Bonilla is coming up. I think that was just one that just got away from Embry. I don't think he was trying to hit Rafi right there. Trying to pitch him inside, fastball in, and that one got away from him a little bit. Well, Mike Cargrove wants to turn Bonilla around, making bat left-handed, so he will come out and get Embry now. He's got Paul Shuey, the big right-hander, another hard thrower in the bullpen, so the change is affected. The base is loaded. Bonilla coming up against Shuey. Five to three, Baltimore. Baltimore five, Cleveland three. Last of the sixth inning, game one of the best of five series. Paul Shuey, the hard throwing right hander, is on the pitch. And he did real well in the regular year. Bobby Bonilla, the hitter, a switch hitter batting left handed. A run is in for Baltimore on an ill advised, almost mis just totally mysterious throw by Manny Ramirez. And the breaking ball is too high. The base runners, Brady Anderson, who has the only hit of the inning, third base. Zeal, who walked at second base. And Palmero, who got hit by a pitch at first base. And Bonilla. He's a little over anxious at times today, hasn't he? Yeah, he's uh, trying a little bit too much. He tried to look, do a little bit too much today. I think a lot of guys are doing that. He had very good success with the bases loaded this year. 95 mile an hour fastball. Two and one. Big moment of this game. Chance for the Orioles to head into the late innings with a more comfortable lead, or for Cleveland to keep it relatively close heading to the late innings. Two down, three men on. That is shot foul. That was 95 miles an hour in the jug's gun, and he was out in front of it. <laughs> well, just lets you know what Bobby's looking for, I guess. <laughs> Be the biggest pitch of the game right here. Davy Johnson knowing that a hit here 
puts the Orioles in great shape. Now to full count. Three and two, and they'll all be running. And again, the big crowd as one rises to its feet. There they go. A high fly ball headed for Utah Street. It's a grand slam. It's nine to three, Baltimore. on the phone and sort of an in joke with the Orioles usually Alan Mills from the bullpen after a big home run calls the dugout and then says it's the it's the White House <laughs> I thought that oh, maybe it was David Letterman why did to show tonight well it could be that too down the right field line extra bases Ramirez digs it out a double for Ripken his third hit see on this pitch to Bobby Bonilla when I first saw it I thought the ball was just above his ankles that's not even a strike David Jackson in the dugout reacting to it trying hard not to get too excited and then Bobby Bow. He's always excited. Bobby's one of them guys. He's just happy to be here. Mike Hargrove had a decision to make. Bobby Bonilla was hitting 303 with 10 homers, batting right handed, 280, 18 homers left handed, with a lot more at bats left handed. Most people feel Bonita, Bonilla is a better right handed hitter. He turned him around. It didn't work. Here's Eddie Murray. Ripken at second, two down. The home run ball. That was the Orioles' favorite weapon of the year. They've given David Wells a six run lead with which to work now. Three home runs for Baltimore, including the grand slam. Murray fouls it back out of play, and he was going downtown with that one, but fouled it back. One ball, one strike. The Orioles hit 11 grand slams this year, and Bonilla hit one of those. But now he's got the big one here in the postseason. Murray standing right at the edge of the shadows. And the slider, and he got a piece of it. One ball, two strikes. But on this inning, I mean, you had the, the crazy throw by Ramirez. How much has that cost him? I mean, if he throws out Hoyles at the plate, the inning's over. The inning's over. Then the big call that put Nagy out of the game. He thought he had Zeno struck out. Drew Coble thought otherwise. And so it goes for Cleveland. Nagy gets charged with seven of the runs. And Murray's down on strikes. That's all for Baltimore. Nine men back. Five of them score. Four on one swing of Bobby Bonilla's back. Nine to three, Baltimore. And we head to the seventh inning. John Miller. Dave Campbell, Kirby Puckett from Baltimore, and the Orioles with a five-run sixth inning now have taken a 9-3 to three lead over Cleveland as we head to the seventh inning. Meanwhile, in St. Louis, they're getting ready to play ball there. The Padres and the Cardinals, Ricky Henderson on the left, Ken Caminetti on the right. The Padres, the winners of the West against the winners of the Central. Game one in St. Louis. That's coming up at 425. And a reminder, especially for you Padres and Cardinal fans, 
Uh, when game time comes, it will be picked up right at first pitch on ESPN2. The Deuce will be picking that one up with live coverage from the first pitch because it's very likely this ball game will still be well in progress. We're just starting the seventh inning. Sandy Alomar singled home run his last time and he is one for two facing David Wells. Alomar standing in the shadows of the late afternoon. The shortstop Cal Ripley. And there's one away. David Wells has retired nine Cleveland Indians in a row since Alomar singled home a run in the fourth inning. John also we talk about keys to the game and you know what Wells has done the first five hitters in the Cleveland lineup all three hundred hitters plus have gone two for fifteen against them a single by Jeff Kent or excuse me is Kevin Seitzer in the first inning a ground ball and a single by Jim Tomey that's been it for the first five hitters in the Cleveland lineup. Now Miss Kell. Yeah, all three of the runs have been produced uh, by the, the six seven eight nine hitters. Vizquel drove in a run the last Cleveland run that was in the fourth inning with a sacrifice fly he's also walked he's not yet had an official at bat a switch in it batting right handed fastball at the knees called a strike now the Baltimore bullpen is working because uh, David Wells is closing in on 100 pitches a lot of people felt the key to Cleveland Jack McDowell was going to have to be important that takes on more importance now with Nagy having a tough first game. It's a ball inside. Two and one. In the bullpen, right handed Terry Matthews, acquired from the Florida Marlins in the summertime. And uh, the left handed, the veteran Jesse Orozco, still pitching after all these many years. Two and one, the count. There's a shot into left field. Surhoff, he tried to barehand it. That ball is now out of play. Came down in play, hit the rubberized warning track, and Spun right back up into the seats. A lot of people, I didn't, I didn't play much outfield, Kirby, but a lot of people say the ball hit directly over your head is one of the toughest. Yeah, that's what they say as an outfielder, but for me, the line drive uh, right at you was the hardest one to judge, but this was a hard one too, especially when you're playing in. BJ tried to catch that ball barehanded. <laughs> tried, to, tried to do a Kevin Mitchell. Oh, man, that was a very nice, very nice try right there, but he's playing kind of shallow, and that's a tough, that's a tough ball to catch right there once it's over your head. He almost caught it. So a double for Vizquel. And that, uh, that's the lady who actually did catch the ball, Kirby, and it was a barehanded catch. <laughs> so she got a souvenir of the division series, and here is Kenny Lofton, one of those uh, key Cleveland hitters, and Wells has kept him off the base paths entirely. He's 0 for 3. He hasn't even reached on a force out. Struck out, flied to shallow left, and lined hard to the shortstop. We said, if, second. we said if you want to beat Cleveland, you definitely have to keep that catalyst off the bases. And uh, so far, Wells has been able to do that with Kenny. But you know, Kenny, he's going to be hurt from uh, sooner or later. So it's just a fact of just holding him down as far as you can. And then hopefully, uh, when he does get hot and get on base and start stealing bases and corrupting everything, that uh, it'll be too late, hopefully. Now, Wells threw 78 pitches the first four innings. But then he threw only nine in the fifth inning, only six in the sixth inning. And uh, now he's thrown uh, seven more in this inning. So Wells, who labored hard the first four innings, has uh, simplified since then. Well, his team also hit for a long time at the bottom of the six and gave a chance to get a second win. A long rest. The Orioles scored five runs in the sixth inning. Two explosive ball clubs, but it's been the Orioles who've done most of the exploding so far today. There goes Fiscal. And Hoyles drops the ball anyway. I don't think it mattered. <laughs> he was in there. And one and one to Lofton. Wells not paying much attention. And Omar said, well, if we're going to come back at this thing, we're going to have to start chipping away at this lead. If he gives me the base, I'm going to take it. Zeal, shallow at third for Lofton. Now, Lofton uh, backs away. You see, he's standing in the shadows, but looking out into that bright sunshine. I think Wells is probably on a pretty short leash right now. They got six great innings out of him, and I don't think Davy Johnson will wait too long. That'll get a run home. Palmero to Wells cover. He got there too late. 
Kenny Lofton gets the infield hit and a run batted in. And Wells got there a little bit late. Yeah, he didn't break right away. It, that's what you're taught as a pitcher. Anytime the ball's hit to the right side to break over, and Wells didn't, uh, he hesitated for a while. And with Kenny Lofton running, you can't hesitate. Well, again, Wells falls off a little bit towards third base, and just that little bit with Lofton speed looked like Wells was trying to tag Lofton or the base. Well, that's a good call by Greg Koss. Maybe Wells should have just gone for the base and tried to tag that. He, that he couldn't. The throw is back. Good call, easily and safely. So it's nine to four. Now these two clubs had a game earlier this year in Cleveland. In fact, the last time they played, and the Orioles took a 13 to 10 lead into the eighth inning and won the ball game 13 to 10. <laughs> Here is Kevin Seitzer. He is singled to left, rounded a third, and struck out. Scoring six times in the bottom of the ninth inning. And David Wells was the starting pitcher that day. Went six innings, gave up three runs, and then the bullpen had a few problems in the last three innings that day. This goes to show you everybody has bad days every now and then. Except you. Yeah. Uh, don't I only wish? I used to smile all the time, so you know if I was having a bad day or a good day. It's called camouflage. <laughs> Kevin Seitzer, one for three in the game. Jim Tomey on deck. Lofton at first, on base for the first time today. And he's back again. Now, one thing too, Dave, you're mentioning uh, about Wells. If the Orioles go through with a plan to use three starting pitchers, and would be due back in game four with three days rest. So they'd like to keep him from extending himself too much in this game. A little surprised that they're still staying with him with all the right handed hitters coming up right now. And the fact, you know, you would think, David, well, he's a left hander, he can keep Lofton closer, but runners 26 for 30 against David Wells when he's on the mound, so that means that he apparently doesn't have a real good move. Well, he's got that slow, deliberate leg kick. He looks at you, and then all of a sudden he lifts his leg real slow. Everything is real slow, so if you guess right. That's a strike. One ball, one strike to Sanctuary. Slipped the old slide step on him though. <laughs> as soon as I said that, he, he slide stepped on me. So it just goes to show you. Forty-seven thousand six hundred forty-four is the paid crowd today. Here Camden Yards. And that's a foul out of play. Of course, the Cleveland Indians. Uh, every game they played at home this year was a sellout. The whole season sold out at Jacobs Field. Yards, uh, not sold out every game, but most of the time. Indians working on 131 consecutive sellouts, and because they lost a game at home this year to rain, which they didn't have to make up with Seattle, now the Rockies are with the current record 132 consecutive sellouts. One ball and two strikes, and Lofton back to the back again. The Orioles ahead nine to four. We're in the top of the seventh inning. Baltimore got five runs in the sixth. Cleveland has come back with one so far here in the seventh. Nine runs, 11 hits for Baltimore, four runs, eight hits for Cleveland. Kevin Saints are the hitter. One ball and two strikes to count. Wells bluffing Lofton back. Jim Tomey, a big left handed hitter, is on deck. I'm guessing did. That's why Wells is still in there. Yep. To stay in through Tomey. 17 lifetime against Wells. And that cut fastball inside. Two balls, two strikes to Seitzer. There's Tommy. Let me go out on a limb here and make a brilliant prediction. David Wells will not face Albert Bell in this city one way or the other. <laughs> it's a brave prediction. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Two well, and two to Seitzer. Get paid the big bucks for making those kind of uh, observations. That's foul.
John Miller, Kirby Puckett, Dave Campbell from Camden Yards in Baltimore. We want to welcome everyone watching on ESPN 2. We're in the seventh inning here in Baltimore, the Orioles 9, Cleveland 4. And we'll be with you here from Baltimore until we take you to St. Louis on ESPN 2 for the beginning of the Cardinals Padres game. Lofton is running. It hits Wells in the foot, and Paul Merrill will get the tag out on Seitzer. It's not the way they work on it in the <laughs> spring, I'll tell you that. What's that goalie's name from Denver? Patrick. Kick, wow. Kick save and a beauty. <laughs> David Wells. Well, Davey Johnson will head out. Now, Richie Bansell, the trainer, is out there with Wells. Well, David certainly doesn't do it with his glove, but with that follow through, it hits him right in the foot. And the Orioles catch a break as it carries strike to Palmero, and Seitzer's out. I guess falling off the mound does help you sometimes, I, I guess. guess. Huh? David, now they're concerned about an injury. I don't know exactly where it got him on the lower leg, but maybe in the ankle. It's a little higher than the ankle, I think. Not not but shin, it, but just maybe on the side a little bit. I know it hurt. That's all I know. Well, it was hit sharply by Sanctuary. David's saying, you know, I got Tome. Can you give me one more guy? But boy, the way that David's walking, I don't know. Now, David Johnson's already made the call. He's signaling the bullpen for Orozco, and Wells will limp off alongside Richie Mansell. Wells goes six and two thirds before departing, tipping his cap to the crowd. Jesse Orozco in to face Jim Tomey. And a foul ball. Strike one, and Orozco almost uh, surely in here just to face the one hitter with a string of right handed batters coming up next. Tomey. Had been decent against the lefties, but still, you'd rather have a lefty facing. David Johnson's really got the hammer right now. A five run lead. He's got eight guys deep in the bullpen. He can do matchups left and right. He's got two more lefties after Orozco. Probably in his wildest dreams, he didn't think he'd have a five run lead in the seventh. And he hits Tommy. David's going, oops, that wasn't the plan. That gets the inning to Albert Bell. And Albert, of course, is well capable of moving Cleveland right back into this game again. No doubt about it. Well, we talked about Tommy standing right on the plate. That one hit him just above the elbow. And Davey wants the right hander, so he's going to start maneuvering. So, first Wells injured. Orozco in, but unable to get his man. Terry Matthews, the right hander, will now come on to face Albert Bell. It'll be back. There's Terry Matthews. He's with the Florida Marlins and then acquired by the Orioles in a trade and really helped solidify their bullpen. They've lost Roger McDowell, a veteran right hander, to injury. And Matthews kind of came in and, and filled that gap for them. Well, he's got a, a big job ahead of him now trying to keep the Orioles well ahead here. What do you think, Kirby? I mean, this guy, Albert Bell, is, you, you better make some good pitches to him with two men on, Lofton at second. And Tommy at first. Definitely has to make good pitches to Albert right here. Else, uh, it's going to be nine to seven, or you know nine to six, or whatever it's going to be. But he has to be careful with Albert and hope that uh, Albert hasn't seen any films of him or anything yet, and uh, he can't uh, go look at anything because right now, if he makes a mistake, you know Albert can hurt him. Well, Albert is 0 for 3 today. Has not been able to get the ball out of the infield. He has faced Matthews in the past. Matthews used to be with the Texas Rangers uh, a few years back. Albert 0 for 3. Of course. Albert was a different hitter himself uh, a few years back. So Cleveland with just the man they want up there when they're trying to get back into a ball game. Lofton at second, Tony at first. Two down, seven to eight. And the runners will advance. First pitch from uh, Matthews. He, he missed by he missed a little bit just a bit outside. <laughs> yeah Terry's going to make sure that first one didn't end up in the left field seats but right now the Orioles have to stem the tide Albert Bell knows that now a base hit can get his club back within three with two full innings plus this inning to go no chance for Royals on that one he didn't do a real good job of shifting. This is a key out in the ball game for the Orioles and for Albert Bell a chance to get his team squarely back in this one. Forty eight homers, one hundred forty eight runs battered in. And he took a fastball. One ball, one strike. 
Well, one thing I know for sure, if you were up there hack hitting, you wouldn't have taken that pitch. That one? No way. Well, why didn't why did he take it? Well, Albert, he likes to see a lot of pitches when he hits sometimes. Like to see the, maybe picking up a location from the uh, release point from the pitcher or just trying to see what he has. He's seen his breaking ball in the dirt and his fastball so far. There's another fastball. Ripken with a great pick. And he throws him out. If that one scoots past him, two runs score, and the inning is still going. Albert Bell hit a shot, and Ripken was able to snare it. The Indians get just the one. Nine to four Baltimore. We go to the last of the seventh. We'll be back. Game one of the division series. The Orioles up nine to four. Could have been nine to six, save for a, a fine play by Cal Ripken to retire Albert Bell. Now the Orioles up against Paul Shuey. B.J. Serhoff, who led off the sixth inning, hitting a comebacker to Charles Nagy. That was the last man Nagy retired. That's a called strike. One ball, one strike. That was so far away, so so long ago, I forgot all about it. Well, Nagy faced 29 hitters in this game and 13 of them reached base against him. Very unusual. He gave up seven runs charged to his record and nine hits and only five in the third innings. Surhoff drives one deep toward the center field bleachers. Another home run. His second of the game. The Orioles fourth as a team. The most prolific home run hitting team of all time. And now they're showing everyone here in the postseason. Ten to four Orioles. DJ goes down, gets one about knee high, and just golfs it into the stands. And Mike Hargrove can only shake his head. And you measure that one, 413 feet. It was up there with plenty to spare. Chris Oyles takes ball one. Serhoff hit a home run August the 18th and did not hit another home run until September the 28th, just this past Saturday. Now we're into the postseason. He's, he's got two in one game. His first postseason game. He never made it with Milwaukee. DJ's enjoying this. See, I think the older guys appreciate this a little bit more. See, when you play for so long and haven't had a chance to get him in the postseason. The Cleveland coming back in the seventh inning, scoring a run. That just the Orioles just send them a message. Sorry, this isn't going to be your day. That was a huge play by Ripken, though, at the end of the inning. Cal's the only guy I know that can back in the short hop and look like he had it all the way. Most guys would go, oh, look at this. Look at this present I found. Look like Cal knew he had it all the way. From my experience playing over here, I see like everywhere I hit the ball, everywhere anybody hit the ball, Cal was standing right there. So Cal, <laughs> he knows exactly where to stand. There's no doubt about it. You hit a ball hard as you can. He catches everything. Oils drives one. Left center, but Bell is there. And that's out number one. Again, now tomorrow afternoon, game two of this series right here in Baltimore. But still to come today, it'll be Joey Hamilton and the Padres, Todd Stottlemyre and the Cardinals. And it'll be starting in just a few minutes, and you'll be able to see it beginning uh, from the first pitch on ESPN 2. We'll bring you the rest of this ball game on ESPN, and then uh, ESPN will then take you to the Padres Cardinals game as well. One ball, no strikes to Brady Anderson. Bell and that is out number two Anderson now two for five he got he sort of set the, the tempo of the day for the Orioles leading off the game the first man to bat for the Orioles in the postseason in 13 years and he hit a home run and they've been hitting them ever since four homers in the game there's nothing new around here man a lot of home runs were hit around here this year if you're fortunate to live in Baltimore and watch these guys play and they hit a lot of home runs and they're continuing that today here's Todd Zeal Zeal takes ball one. And another one of those uh, veteran guys, Kirby. 
who finished the year in a real big slump. He's got two hits and a walk today, including the, the controversial walk. Charles Nagy thought he had him struck out in the sixth inning. B.J. Suroff, a couple of homers. Cal Ripken, three hits. Bobby Bonilla, the grand slam. I don't know who's going to be the hero. To show up. And Sicker in there for a strike. Well, Kirby Puckett is here with us, and we're glad to have you, Kirby. But I know somebody very special to you is missing you today. Yeah, my wife Tanya and my today's Lil Kirby's birthday, so he's four years old. So I want to say hi to Lil Kirby and happy birthday, and, and hi to my daughter Catherine, and hi to Tanya and the rest of my family. All right, the Puckets who are gathered around the television set. <laughs> Not anymore. Now that I just said hi. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's scattered out of there now. <laughs> Time to go outside and play. Yeah, probably. They've been waiting for that all day. <laughs> okay, kids. <laughs> Take off. Three and one. <laughs> and three and two to zero. Well, this year, we, we were talking about it earlier. This Cleveland bullpen was such a, a great source of strength last year. This year, the bullpen was very good. But this is not the kind of thing that happened to Cleveland last year. And they went to that bullpen, and that bullpen shut you down. Last year, the seventh, eighth, and ninth innings, they gave up the fewest runs in the major leagues. Not true this year. Well, this time, Zeal gets called out. Strike three. We're going to the eighth inning. Franco, then Ramirez coming up. Ten to four, Baltimore. Game summary: Baltimore ahead, ten to four. The top five Cleveland hitters, Lofton, Saint Tommy, Bell, and Franco, have been shut down pretty effectively. Ramirez has had a big day. B.J. Serhawk, two home runs in his first ever postseason game. Here's Matthews giving up a base hit to center field to Julio Franco, the fifth place hitter. And that's only the first hit for him and only the fourth for those top five hitters. There's Mark Parent now catching for Baltimore, replacing Hoyles. And now Manny Ramirez will come up 10 to 4. The Orioles on top in the eighth inning. Right the fielder. four home runs in the ball game for the Orioles. And that is uh, not very common in the postseason. In the the history of the American League Championship Series, and of course this is not the Championship Series. This is the the new Divisional Series. And the Championship Series began in 1969. Bobby Bonilla has one of the Orioles' four homers today, a grand slam. Surhoff's got two, and of course Brady Anderson had one. But in the ALCS, only three teams have ever hit as many as four home runs in a game. Uh, the Orioles won 1971. And Oakland did it in 73 against Baltimore and again in the game in 74 against Baltimore. And no team has done it since then. But now the Orioles have done it here in a divisional series game. Ramirez with Cleveland's only home run. Fastball in there for a strike. One and one the count. Of course they have records uh, but with only one division series under our belt which is uh, year two of the great experiment. Tell you one thing about Cleveland though, Terry Matthews better keep making quality pitches because these guys are going to start hammering if they see pitches in the middle of the plate. Both bullpens are busy as Matthews goes to work on Ramirez. And the curveball going outside, two and one. Oral Hershiser, Scott Erickson. Erickson's been the Orioles best pitcher down the stretch. His last six starts have been terrific. So the Indians, if they don't come back and rally in this one, have a big task ahead of them tomorrow. Two and one to Ramirez. He's two for three today. Fastball, base hit. Back to back singles for Cleveland here in the eighth inning. Sir Hoff throws behind Franco back into second base to Roberto Alomar. Third hit of the game for Ramirez. Tomorrow at 1 o'clock here in ESPN. Oral Hershiser 15 and 9. And Scott Erickson 13 and 12. But he did win five of his last six decisions. So that will be tomorrow. 1 o'clock right here on ESPN. Game 2. And if this score holds up. And with this Cleveland lineup. We know we're, we're a long way from, from knowing how this one's going to turn out yet. Although the Orioles certainly like their chances. As Jeff Kent comes up. But if the Orioles win this one. Really, a must win for Cleveland tomorrow. I mean, you, Seattle did it last year, fell behind two games to none, but generally speaking, in the best of five, you lose the first two, you're on your way out. Terry Matthews not fooling anybody. Two hits here and a rocket that ripped him. Grab last inning. 
Roberto Alomar. The infield fly is finally called. As Alomar catches it anyway. So Kent is now one for four. The runners hold. Franco at second. Ramirez at first. And that will bring up Sandy Alomar. Uh, I don't see him up. Maybe they're going to pinch it for him as Alomar is down in the dugout. Is this Brian Giles yeah. going to be coming up? Brian Giles comes up out of the dugout. A young and real strong left-handed hitter. You get a chance to see him, Kirby, at all? Yeah, yeah I think he, um, Aguilera, I think when I was in Minnesota, I think he had a grand slam or something off Aggie. I think he mentioned him this year. He's not a real big guy, but he's real, he's real solid. Yeah, he's real solid. He can hit the ball a long way, so pretty strong little kid. He hit 355 for Cleveland after being caught up in the minor leagues in 121 at bats. David Johnson saw enough of him too. He went 13 for 20 against the Orioles, and Davey's on his way out. He's not going to let him hit against the right-hander. Last time the Orioles saw Giles, he was hitting about 470 for the year, and mostly against them. Well, Arthur Rhodes, who has only pitched one time since early August, has gotten the call. Two on, one out, and we'll be back. Right now we're in downtown Baltimore near the Inner Harbor, Camden Yards. And the Orioles are leading the Cleveland Indians 10 to 4, but Cleveland with two men on and one man out with the powerful Brian Giles coming up against that man, Arthur Rhodes, Kirby. Arthur Rhodes can be tough, man. He's another one of these hard throwing guys here. We got a lot of hard throwers on both sides here today. And uh, Arthur Rhodes throws about 90 some miles an hour fastball and a good slider. I mean, he's not deceptive like a Jesse Roscoe is going to, has a lot of motion or anything. I mean, he just comes right at you straight and hard and got a good slider to go with it. So Arthur Rhodes with two men on, one man out. Franco at second base, Ramirez at first. Giles, a 355 hitter in limited duty after being called up to the minor leagues. And it's ball one, 93 miles an hour on the Jugs gun there with that reading. Now Arthur Rhodes got injured and was put on the disabled list in early August. And uh, was thought lost for the season. They came back in late September, and uh, the idea was that maybe he could be strong enough to face one hitter in the postseason. And this is the idea. This is the hitter, and uh, most likely after facing Giles, he'll be out of there. Although well, if he gets him out quickly, they might leave him in. You got the switch hitting Biscal and another lefty, Lofton. But Davey Johnson knows that Arthur has no stamina whatsoever. I mean, he sat out for nearly two months. Pitched one time since then. That was two thirds of an inning in the Sky Dome on Sunday. One and two now to Giles. Well, Mike Hargrove, I'm sure, knew that Davey Johnson was going to go to the left hander, but Giles hitting 364 against the lefties, and he might also have looked up the number that Rhodes gave up six home runs this year, all to left handed batters. Two men on, one man out in the eighth inning. And that misses. Two and two now. Both bullpens are busy again. Randy Myers, the Orioles' closer, is warming up. The veteran left-hander. And the Cleveland bullpen is also busy now. Aaron, uh, Julian Tavares, the right-hander, warming up for them. Strike three call. Out number two. And here's an update now from Gary Miller. John at Bush, Todd Stolomar in a jam. Two aboard, Gwynn double, Finley hit with a pitch 2-2 two -two count to potential MVP Ken Caminiti. He loves the changeup, and he struck him out, then got Jordan a ground out. Leaves two aboard, and the Cardinals come to bat in the bottom of the first. Back to you. All right, Gary. Great uh, pitching there by Stolomar to get out of the jam. Now Arthur Rhodes trying to get out of the jam here. Two men on, two men out. Omar Vizquel, the hitter. The dirt knocked down by Parent, the new catcher. It is one ball and no strikes. Right field really becomes a difficult sun field now. Bobby Bonilla, the Orioles right fielder, holding the glove up in front of his uh, face, shading the eyes before every pitch. Yeah, fly balls can be pretty tough for a right fielder right now. One ball, one strike. You see the reading on the jugs gun there. 92 miles an hour. Rhodes did a very good job for the Orioles out of the bullpen, coming in sometimes throwing two, three, four innings at a time. It was nine and one.
for them in that role. Vizcal has not been retired except for a sacrifice flight today. Runs with a change up there. And it is two and one. You ever seen him throw a change up before Kirby? Uh, not many. <laughs> <laughs> he usually throws just a lot of fastballs and a little slider, but he's got uh, he's got a great arm, and I think he might have found his niche out there in the bullpen. Did a great job for the Orioles this year. Two on, two on, two and one the count. Zeal right at the bat. And that is the inning. We're going to the last of the eighth. Roberto Alomar, Rafael Palmero, Bobby Bonilla do up 10 to 4 Baltimore. Camden Yards 10 to 4, the Orioles leading the Cleveland Indians. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the office of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent. I assume of the office of the Commissioner of Baseball. <laughs> Julian Tavares on to pitch now, and Roberto Alomar will be leading it off for the Orioles again. The umpires arrived today about 10 minutes before 1 o'clock with uh, no agreement with uh, baseball, no injunction was uh, gotten by baseball in court, but they. Uh, did at least agree that the umpires would work the first two days of the playoffs and that, that they would move up a hearing on Roberto Alomar's uh, status to Thursday the umpires could still walk out after that hearing is uh, finished I guess if they don't like the result but the umpires are here so we got a late start we didn't start till 25 after one and now uh, the Orioles are ahead 10 to 4 as Roberto Alomar faces Julian Tavares he was uh, just outstanding out of that Cleveland bullpen last year, Dave. Well, a lot of speculation. He wasn't going to be on the postseason roster, a late addition, and they took Albie Lopez and Kent Merker. They've got down between Tavares and those two guys. Vizcal got him. Back in the sixth inning, the Orioles with a five-run rally. There were some big plays in that inning that could have made it otherwise. Todd Zeal was batting with one out and two men on. And this pitch called ball four instead of strike three that loaded the bases. Then this fly ball by Roberto Alomar and Manny Ramirez instead of throwing home against the slow footed Hoyles and inexplicably threw it to shortstop as Hoyles scored. Keeping the inning going for Bobby Bonilla and he launched one. A grand slam. And that made it a five run inning. The score then was nine to three for the Orioles. And of course, it could have been much, much different. The throw by Ramirez alone, had he thrown home, probably would have ended the inning with just a one run Baltimore lead. Instead, five runs ended up scoring. Palmero is one for three, an RBI double. He's also been hit by a pitch and scored a run. And the count goes to 2 0. Oh. Tony Pena is now catching for Cleveland, replacing Alomar, who had been lifted for a pinch hitter. 10 to 4 Baltimore, last of the eighth inning. Bobby Bonilla is on deck. What a changeup, good pitch. Two little changeup. Welcome to the American League. I saw you frowning over there. You look disgusted. Well, two and no usually gets you looking for something to drive. You're not looking for a changeup, you know. Yeah. But, He's uh, supposed to throw what you're looking for, right? Well, that's Tony Pena catching, though. He, he goes against <laughs> all odds. Palmero well, lifts a foul and out of play. Two and two the count. There's Oral Hershiser. He'll be starting tomorrow. Of course, Oral has always had great success in the postseason. I mean, he's just been at his very best in the biggest ball games. And it will be huge for Cleveland tomorrow if they lose this game. He's going to have to be huge tomorrow, too, if they're going to stay in this thing. If they, if they don't win today. Romero swings and misses. Strike three. Two down. We've got an update from St. Louis with Gary Miller. John, the Cardinals come to bat. Ron Gann have been hit by a pitch by Joey Hamilton. With Clayton aboard, he ground, McGee grounds into the double play. McGee, of course, playing for Lankford. Gant is now on after being hit by a pitch. In the bottom of the first, we take you back to Baltimore. All right, Gary. And we'll be going to that ball game as soon as this one is over. Bobby Bonilla, you know, a nice ovation. 
He didn't look all that good in his earlier at bats. He also made an ill-advised throw from the outfield. And then in the sixth inning, all was forgiven. A grand slam to break the game open. 2-0 to Bonilla. John, just to go back to the naggy pitch to Zeal, we did a breakdown on baseball tonight of, uh, about a month ago. And what we did eliminated the DH in the American League and the pitcher in the National League. So we would just have the eight position players, 400 more walks in the American League, 1,000 more strikes in the National League. I can't believe the pitching's that much better in the National League. I really think the National League umpires have a more liberal strike zone. Well, it could be. I mean, they, the National League has its umpires. The American League has a whole different set. There's ball four to Bonilla. And two I walk. Second time he's walked in this game, and that will bring up Cal Ripken, who has three hits today. One thing you hear more than anything else from players and veteran baseball observers is especially strike three. The American League umpires seem more reluctant to punch out guys, especially if they're superstars. <laughs> Any count? <laughs> oh, come on now. I don't believe that. Bobby Bonilla is leaving the game now. Mike Devereaux will go in to run for him over at first base. Very common for Davey Johnson to bring in Devereaux as a defensive replacement for Bonilla late in the ball games in which the Orioles are ahead. There's Devereaux. He was the MVP of the National League Championship Series for Atlanta last year. Now back in Baltimore. Here's Cal Ripken. Two singles and a double and a run battered in. Vizquel and Kent gets the put out on Devereaux at second. Now we go to the ninth inning. The top of the order for Cleveland. Last chance. Lofton, Seitzer, Tomey. 10 to 4, the Orioles. Here it is 10 to 4 for the Orioles. And the Indians' leadoff man, Kenny Lofton, comes up against the new Baltimore pitcher, Randy Myers. And that is in there for a strike. Lofton is 1 for 4 with an RBI. Randy Myers, the veteran closer. Four and four, 31 saves for the year. A lot of strikeouts this year. Myers in 58 and two-thirds innings had 74 strikeouts. B.J. Serhoff. A day to remember for Serhoff. His first postseason game. Kind of a day you dream of in, in the postseason, isn't it? It's the kind of day you dream of any time, during the season any time, but especially uh, during this time. That makes it make makes it feel more special. Like I said, BJ hasn't been around in the postseason ever, so this is his first time, and he just wants to show people the how excited he is. Two home runs. He made a very fine catch. There's Mike Devereaux, by the way, now in the ball game in right field. He made a fine catch and a ball hit by Tommy back in the fifth inning out in left center. Here's his former teammate, Seitzer, also in his first postseason game. He is one for four. Well, tomorrow, it looks like a must win situation for Cleveland. Although, if they win tomorrow, the whole series shifts to Cleveland, to Jacobs Field, and uh, the Orioles have never played well there. They beat Cleveland twice the last time they were in there, breaking a, a 10 game losing streak at the Jake. And Mike Hargrove and his ball club, they didn't play as well at the Jake this year as they did last year. But they've always got to feel good when they're playing there. Indians have so well set up if they can advance. I mean, they have a possibility if, if the playoffs and World Series and Division Series were to go the full 19 games, five, seven, and seven, they would have 11 games out of that at home. Last year, they had to go to Atlanta for the World Series, but this year it's set up perfectly for them, but they've got to get past this first round. Last year, in the divisional series, Cleveland played the Boston Red Sox, a divisional winner themselves. And they swept the Red Sox in three games, although Boston played them pretty tough. One game went to extra innings. That's a foul. Tony Pena won it finally with a, with a dramatic home run for Cleveland. They had to get past Roger Clemens in another ball game. But they swept the Red Sox. But now, a year later, facing the wild card team and the Orioles have put it to him today four homers they lead 10 to 4 Jack McDowell would be scheduled to go in game one in Cleveland against his old Stanford mate Mike Messina the Orioles ace a 19 game winner two smart guys going at it <laughs> how'd you hit against those smart guys I don't know I, they're both tough just, I just thank God I don't play baseball That's anymore. From let's what put I, it that way from what we've heard from you today you must have hit about 190 <laughs> Strike three call. The 
Three two slider. Now Seitzer figures with a six run lead he's just going to challenge throw a strike and Randy drops up money. Right after the game we'll take you to St. Louis the Padres and Cardinals they're already underway. Stay tuned for that tonight at eight o'clock. The Rangers and the Yankees game one on NBC. Strike one to Tony. And the fans at Camden Yards without a postseason game at all in 13 years are savoring this one. Everyone on their feet now in anticipation of the final out. One and one the count. David Wells six and two third innings. He left ahead. It's his game to win. Charles Nagy not the sharp Charles Nagy we're used to seeing. Two and one the count. John, obviously the four home runs, the grand slam by Benia Big, but David Wells, he kept the first five hitters in the lineup to a three for 17. He retired the first batter in an inning six out of seven times. He gave the Orioles a lot more than maybe they were to expect. And now, two balls, two strikes to Matt, to uh, Tommy, two down in the ninth inning. Tomorrow, one o'clock. It looks like a must-win situation for Cleveland. They don't want to go home down two games to none. Cal Ripken and the Orioles and Cleveland again tomorrow, right here on ESPN at one o'clock. Struck him out. And game one goes to Baltimore. David Wells wins it. Nagy the loser. Serhoff a couple of home runs. Bonilla the grand slam. The Orioles now with a big ball game tomorrow. Must win for Cleveland. We'll see you tomorrow at 1.